Joshuan Shu conducts postdoctoral research in the Department of Oceanography, National Sun Yat-sen University in Taiwan. He has published several science articles about land hermit crabs and devotes much of his time to land hermit crab conservation, activism, and education. His expertise and research interests include environmental conservation, environmental interpretation, marine ecology and conservation, community empowerment, and wildlife management. Today he will be talking about the conservation crisis for land hermit crabs in Taiwan. Please welcome Joshua Shu. Hello guys, thank you for inviting me again to join the crab can this year. I am Joshua Shu from Taiwan. Uh, it, in this, in this time, I hope you are all safe. Today, my topic is about the uh, ecology of land hermit crabs in Taiwan, conservation through ecotourism. I will introduce some case of the ecotourism and how successful they are. If you have any question, please just let me know. Okay. First, introduce myself. I am a postdoc research researcher in uh, Department of Oceanography, National Sun Yat-sen University, and my education background is uh, I graduated from Department of Oceanography. It's yes, it's my work uh, place, and my PhD. It, was graduated from uh, School of Forestry and Resource Conservation, National Taiwan Youth University. And my research interest is about the ecology of land crabs, conservation, and environmental education. If you want to know more my detail, you can screen the QR code to uh, have a look to my uh, experience or my publication and, and so on. Yes, I also was a research scholar in Oregon, Oregon State Grant, Oregon State University last year. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, so I came back to Taiwan earlier. So I hope you are all safe now. So, if you are the newcomer to my presentation, uh, I want to introduce where is Taiwan first. Uh, Taiwan is located uh, located in uh, Asia, East West Asia. So, if you are in USA, the distance of you your country and Taiwan is about. Uh, 6,000 miles. Yeah, it's pretty far. So Taiwan is located in the tropical area, sub-tropical and tropical area. So we have very, a lot of small islands near the Taiwan main island. Uh, this location of the label is uh, are my research sites. So when I was a master degree student, I conducted a lot of experiments in these islands. So I am an ecology of land hermit crab experts. And because of Taiwan have a lot of habitat diversity. We have several species of land hermit crabs in Taiwan. So let's see. Uh, according to the report, I mean the rec record, there are six spe species of land hermit crabs in Taiwan. Nelly Ruckus, Bravamanus, 
Uh, I am not sure my pronunciation is correct or not, but I am trying. And calipers, violences, purpurers, and burgers not true, the coconut crabs. Actually, it's seven species. Uh, I found a new record species recently, but not yet published. So maybe next year I can share which is the new record species is. Okay, let's move on. So I want to introduce you my workplace. Uh, my campus is National Sun Yat-sen University. It's located in southern of Taiwan, Kaohsiung City. I think my workplace is the dream place for Lake Hermikoi lovers because in our campus you can see three kinds of Lake Hermikoi always walk around in the campus at night. So what kinds of these three kinds what kind of these three hermit crabs is Bernavalus, uh, Caripus, and Ruggersus. Yes, uh, so it, it's fantastic, right? You can walk with our, our love species. And this three picture was the to the location of these three kinds of species. Uh, Cavipers live near the sea and Cavipers and Bernavalus can live uh, far from the sea. So we can we can see them in the mountain area especially in, in our uh, dormitory I mean department and a lot of, of buildings when the breeding season is coming they always can see in the building or the on the road oh by the way let me introduce my published paper also talk about the niche difference of niche difference of these three kinds of land home crabs yeah, it's these three kind of Lanham crest are the most common species in Taiwan. Uh, it's our campus. Uh, in the campus we have the beach and and the mountain side. So it's the very good environment for these animals. Yeah, if you have chance, welcome you. To come here, yeah, maybe we can walk around and find some hermit crabs, and it's really really good. So here, uh, as uh, as an ecologist, so I need to con convince the student why learn why learn or why study the hermit crabs are so important. Because they live under the coastal forest, and coastal forest is the very important part of human being. They can prevent the typhoon or uh, some big climate e event to protect us. So here, maybe we live here. It's a firm or some building here and coastal forest can become a wall to prevent the damage of the natural disaster and then homicry can become the seed uh, I mean the seed disposal role these two, uh, I mean, they can uh, eat a lot of uh, organic, organic matter 
in the coastal forest and digest another nutrient for the uh, forest because we, we know the coastal forest always have always have less uh, nutrient so let me create become the uh, nutrient cycle uh, become a, an important role in the nutrient cycle system in coastal forest so we can know that hermit crabs are really our friends because they can help us to prevent the nature disaster they help the coastal forest and coastal forest become the wall to protect us and then uh, the dead hermit crabs also contribute to the fisheries results. Uh, fisheries results are based on the uh, loop plankton. We know this is the food chain, right? The loop plankton is the kino uh, animals in the marine ecosystem. They can eat phytoplankton and small fish eat the root plankton, bigger fish eat the small fish, and then bigger fish can that the marine mammals or human beings have the food resource. So I think the land crabs or land hermit crabs, uh, lava can contribute marine ecosystems another uh, food resource, resources so they are also important for the marine ecosystem here I want to introduce two cases of the ecotourism because I think the ecotourism is the uh, best way to make the nature uh, nature, I mean the wildlife and human being balance. So here, uh, the first case is, is from the uh, southern of Taiwan National uh, Kantin National Park, and the first located is uh, Kantin Youth Activity Center. Uh, here, I want to do. I want to introduce my friend uh, Miss, Miss Huang. He, uh, she already contributed to the uh, Lake Hermitage Conservation for several, several years. They recruit a lot of uh, empty show from all around Taiwan. I mean the Taiwanese people uh, know this message and donate a lot of uh, empty show from their home for the Lake Hermit Crabs. So she just uh, puts the show and uh, in this area and the Lake Hermit Crabs will exchange the better show which she gave. A lot of hermit crabs changed the better show from here and left the bad show. Why is bad show? Like the garbage or something else. So Miss Huang collected this uh, bad show or garbage from the late hermit crab left and she collected like this for several years and this can remind the people how we impact the environment and also the hermit crabs and she also developed some uh, curriculum for the environment uh, elementary school students so the students can learn a lot of biological uh, knowledge from from her uh, to know more about the, the hermit crabs. I think it's a good case.
for you to know how we conserve the lanker bee crabs in Taiwan. Yes, here we can see, always see a lot of lanker bee crabs uh, carry the garbage show in the coastal forest or in, uh, on the beach. The second case is about the ecotourism in at the uh, Gangko community. Gangko community uh, develop uh, an uh, it interpretation program to guide guide the uh, tourism. I mean the tourists to know the nature resource at their area. So it, oh, I, I think of this always be a you might be confused that why I say coconut crab is the largest land hermit crab species. Actually there are really a kind of land hermit crab because they have a life cycle of carry the bag, carry the shoe. They have, they must carry the shoes in one or two years and they let the shoe become the coconut crabs which we look like. And these kinds of uh, periods are really uh, mis miserable, I mean, B because the scientists all over the world are wondering how they live, I mean, how they live in this stage, what is their habitat and behavior and so on are also uh, less known in, in uh, uh, I mean, let's know now. In Taiwan, the first uh, coconut crabs carrying the shoes are found by me, but the said, but it's said because it's a rocky individual. So, in Taiwan, we never find, never found the coconut crab which carry the show except, except of this this one. So yes we can't know very clear about the uh, this life stage of coconut crab. We are, we are still researching. And the coconut crabs are really severe of the uh, population decline. So uh, this journal also invite me to write an article about the coconut crabs. I want to let the uh, Indo-Pacific Ocean country know uh, coconut crabs are really uh, in danger and uh, repeat, uh, repeat decline. Uh, another uh, issue is about the po uh, poach. Uh, because we know uh, land hermit crabs are a, a kind of pest, right? And I encourage people to get the crabs off from the cap captive breeding. But in Taiwan, this kind of skill is not major. So the crabs are always get get from the uh, wild. So this kind of animal are always uh, poached from the national park, and we also notice the population declined in some place. I mean, I don't oppose to have the land hermit crab as pet, but I encourage our people to have the captive breeding individual.
Yes, uh, we are still researching about how uh, how to increase the successful rate of the captive breeding individual. Yeah, you know uh, Xi Shen, right? He, he is the famous pe person uh, of captive breeding of the dead hermit crabs in Taiwan. And we already uh, collaborated some uh, research. It's now ongoing. Uh, another crisis of the lanthermy crabs is the uh, invention species, yellow crazy ant. This kind of rats already invented in some, in a lot of countries. So uh, in Taiwan, we also uh, find this kind of species invented in southern of Taiwan especially in National Canteen, uh, Canteen National Park. Uh, it's getting severe because some scientists find uh, a large uh, decline because of this, this species invented. So we are finding some ways to uh, deal with this problem. So thank you for inviting me again to join the crab camp and I know um, my pronunciation may be a little bit unclear and, and uh, during the crab camp I will be there and if you have any question I can re reply to you immediately. Thank you for your listening and I am looking for for more uh, comments or some uh, your idea or, or we can have some collaboration in the future. Thank you very much. Like most Indonesians, Rizki was first exposed to land hermit crabs, or kelamang as they're commonly known, from street peddlers selling the critters by the scent in front of his primary school. And like most Indonesians, he bought them eagerly by the bucket load. And they all sadly died by the bucket load too. The next time he decided to keep crabs again was during his stay in Australia about 10 years ago when he kept a group of C. variabilis and a large C. perlatus who happened to be a big bully and knocked the smaller Oz crabs around, pinging them off the tank walls with its fat pincers. It was then he found the Crab Street Journal in its previous Yahoo Groups iteration, still managed by Vanessa and the initial knowledge of proper crab keeping, although crab bathing was still very much the norm back then. Now, living in Jakarta, Indonesia with his family, he's been back into the hermit crab mix for the past two years and is one of the administrators of KLI, Kelamang Lovers Indonesia. His goal is to elevate the Kelamang to exotic pet status and afford them the love and care that they deserve, not treat them as cheap throwaway children's pets. Oh, and he would really like to be the first Indonesian Mary Acres too. He wrote that and made me say it, by the way. Other than hermit crabs, Rizki also keeps rainbow fish, a group of native Indo-Australian fishes highly threatened by habitat destruction. Please welcome Rizki. Hi everybody, my name is Rizki from Indonesia. Uh, I did a talk in last year's CrabCon. Uh, it was about substrate and um, it ended up being a bit embarrassing because I had a bad cold while recording the presentation last year and you could clearly hear me snorting and sneezing uh, but this year fortunately I'm in a much better shape and hopefully it will result in a much more interesting talk 
So today I'll be talking about my breeding method, uh, which of course heavily derived from Mary Akers' method. And uh, Mary indeed has been really patient in guiding me throughout the process. Um, for background info on Mary's breeding methods, please check out her awesome talk in this year's CrabCon or go to YouTube to watch her 2020 presentation. The title of my talk is The Filtered Chrysal, A Lazy Breeder's Guide to Raising Hermit Crab Zoe. And uh, these are my Zoe Fia, from a few months ago. And um, of course, due to different geographical location and resource availability and whatnot, my approach, uh, there are some unavoidable differences um, compared to Mary's one. Uh, some major, some minor, some worked, some did not work. And I'll be talking about all of that today. And just to give you guys a heads up, I think there will be a lot more pictures and videos than text in this presentation. All right, so I think uh, first off, back in 2019, I think, before any of my crabs were showing mating behavior or indeed carrying any signs of eggs, I was already fascinated by Mary's successful breeding attempts and decided that I would try and see if I can breed them myself. One, because I love trying to breed my own pets, like um, I had um, betta fish before, I bred my betta, I bred my goldfish, I bred lots of kinds of fish already, I had snails before and they bred. So I actually love um, trying to breed different species of animals. And secondly, it is the logical thing to do. If we want to ultimately break the chain of harvesting from the wild and furthering the hermit crab conservation efforts. So as you can see from the pictures, this is my first version of my chrysal tank, which is very much like Mary's double chrysal. You can see there are two drums there. Here you can see from the picture, I was testing it by filling it with water. And uh, you can see two drums there, uh, just like Mary's, yeah. But one major difference from Mary's chrysal is from the beginning, I really want to include a filter, a biological and mechanical filter. Reading Mary's breeding posts in the Facebook group, one thing that always stuck out to me is how much work is involved in raising the zoe and how exhausted Mary always seemed to be every day in her posts. So I surmise that most of the work actually comes from trying to always keep the water quality in good shape. And uh, Mary did that by changing part of the chrysal water multiple times a day and also siphoning out the leftover food and skin sheds, which were also an everyday thing. So me being a lazy breeder, like the title says, having a chrysal that has a working filter to cut down some of that work is a huge priority for me. And to do that, you can see here, I made the chrysal drums not exclusive from the tank, as opposed to Mary's chrysal, which uh, the water in the drums is actually completely isolated from the water in the tank. So my tank is about 80 liters full um, and as you can see here, there are rectangular cutouts and I attach fine mesh and um, uh, pad them up with cotton pads here. Yeah. The holes of the mesh itself is around 0.5 millimeters. No, I think it's smaller, around 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters here. Yeah. And it's to keep the Zoe from escaping into the main area of the tank and get sucked up into the filter. Yeah, so even the Zoe are pretty small, yeah, but they're not like microscopically small. Yeah. You can still see them with your naked eyes. So as long as the mesh holes uh, are not uh, bigger than 0 0.5 millimeters, I think it's uh, it's going to be fine. Yeah, and as you can see here on the left here, the filter sits at the bottom and there's a pipe uh, going up to a T-joint and it divides yeah, into two spray bars going into both drums and therefore creating the circular flow that I'm looking for. And the drums are made of dark colored semi-rigid canopy plastic and you can see all the silicone uh, 
attachment here all around the drum edges so everything was looking good um, all was working well uh, so I drained the tank completely I scrubbed it clean and I, and then and I dried it out and put it in storage and ready for future breeding action then about a year later in November 2020 uh, I finally had a chance to test the Chrysler for real when Felix, our esteemed uh, friend Felix, contacted me saying that he got a couple of beautiful dark black perlados carrying eggs and uh, they made it actually in his care and he was willing to bring them to me. So these are the some pictures of the black perlados that was carrying the eggs aren't they beautiful hey i think this is uh, the middle stages i think it's still not uh, transparent yet yeah but you can already see the eyes there so this is probably around 10 days around 10 days away from being hatched so i then very quickly went and set up the chrysal that was already sitting in the storage for a long while for a year but however many things happened to that chrysal uh, the silicone that was holding the drum uh, had fatigued and as a result the drums had completely unraveled almost as soon as water was filled in the tank well i should have guessed that because um, the canopy plastic itself was originally straight yeah and I was trying to uh, make a circular drum out of it it didn't work yeah uh, the plastic wanted to, to be to be straight again and as a result it unraveled and also at one time the bottom glass of the tank cracked all the way from the front to the back so I had to replace that too but at, in the end it was too much hassle to persist with this chrysal and sorry I have no pictures because it was too sad looking so this chrysal mark one nope not gonna use so anyway that happened so I had to quickly build myself a new chrysal and this time I had to make sure that the new design would be more practical and more durable so I built a new one entirely with my local aquarium shop's help and with design here is the second design as you can see here the principle is the same three chambers uh, one connected to each other through the mesh here it's the same mesh that I used for the uh, for the first chrysal but this time instead of a small square I extend it from end to end uh, but this time I don't use any cotton padding so let's have a look what we have here so we got the plastic cover on the top to prevent evaporation then the same thing spray bar here and the filter in the middle fine mesh yeah um, 0 0.5 millimeters smaller than 0 0.5 millimeters and then the direction of flow is like this I had a few tries uh, trying to get the direction the the flow direction correct and I settled with this by by doing it like this the water comes out of the spray bar from here actually onto the fine mesh then it dropped down and it goes around like this of course in the other chamber the direction will be mirrored just like so so in this chrysal I, I don't have a circular drum so to replicate the same effect I stick some glass panes at the bottom at 45 degree angles so it allows the water to flow just like in a drum here and some specifications here uh, it's not that big it's actually almost half the full capacity of the first chrysal but it's okay because the drum itself uh, I think the volume of the drum or the or the or the chrysal chambers are almost the same 
uh, only the middle chamber is decreased. Now, if needed, the heater would sit in the middle chamber along with the filter and of course the thermometer there. Now, the water temperature here is ambient air temperature. Yeah, I don't need to use uh, a heater uh, being in Indonesia, a tropical country. And the temperature here stays around 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. It might seem high to a lot of you, but rest assured, it's the usual temperature here, and actually the Zoe uh, did really well there. So the filter here is actually too strong. It is rated at 1000 liters per hour, which is way more than the small aquarium can handle. So what I did was I made lots of holes in the vertical pipe here to disperse the water in the small chamber first so when it comes out in the spray bar uh, in the chambers here in the chrysal chamber it's not as strong and you can actually make more holes if you think it's still too strong so in this one I'm going to show you a video of how the articulation look like of the pipes here yep I'm sorry it's a little bit dirty because this was in between batches yeah so this crystal has been uh, his has already been used and as you can see you can freely move around the spray bar uh, up and down side to side and you can you can stick the pipe at the height that you want and you can see here the small holes to disperse the water in the middle chamber before it goes into the chrysal chambers here and here I got a video showing the chrysal in action actually in both chambers yep as you can see the, the flow is mirrored the left and right to be honest this design is really very simple compared to the ones devised by the Taiwanese and other uh, Asian keepers yeah you can see the pictures on their Instagram and uh, Facebook groups and um, they made it with custom curved acrylic and got specialized filtration then I mean they really go all in so this one again it's a really simple design but it works and if you're curious why I got a piece of coral in there it's just to provide some buffer to the water so I don't get pH crashes so let's talk about spawning and raising Zoe to Megalopa so in this video here I'm going to show you that particular uh, dark perlatus given by Felix right in the beginning of this presentation and this video shows how the eggs were hatched and the zoe uh, were released into the water you can see the zoe flicking around floating around in the water so this is a spawning tank I put uh, some salt water seawater inside an, a small tank put some bubblers in it and then basically put the put the um, put the hermit crabs in there and the hermit crabs will just the perlatus will just walk around yeah feeling its way and trying and then eventually pushing the zoe out of the shell and into the water uh, this is a video showing that the same dark perlatus actually using the bubbler I've put in the tank to release the Zoe
Okay, just okay. You can see there are many more zoes um, floating in the water there. Okay, and this next one here is when the mummy crab finished releasing all of her eggs and uh, I brought the tank near the chryso and I was transferring all the zoe in the tank into the chryso tank yep there are, there is literally thousands in there just in that one scoop probably there are, there's a thousand in there or more so the net I'm using here is the net you use to sieve baby brine shrimp yeah so you and you use that net to separate the baby artemia the the baby brine shrimp from the empty eggshells uh, from your hatchery so other than felix's perlatus finally my own crabs gave me some eggs and uh, this rugosus here and a couple more different ones uh, actually mated and uh, produced eggs yeah they are, i think they produced eggs from november yeah until now even yeah so i don't know if there are seasons for mating and breeding but at least for rugosus as far as i can see here it's a year-round thing and there's no seasons as such and they some of them actually carried eggs mere days after they released their previous batch into the salt water so this is one rugosus and there's another one here and there was a pink one also that uh, that was carrying eggs uh, this particular one here this white one here uh, actually have spawned at least three times already uh, from November until now until June at least so I hope my other crabs the brevimanus and the viola and even the lila might give me some eggs in the future so with the rugosus i tried new things to assist them to release the eggs yeah when they're uh, when they're looking mature so what i tried to do with the rugosus was um, i made this contraption here which is um if i think the eggs are about 48 to 72 hours away from hatching i put the rugosus in this hatching platform here and um, the aim for the platform is to provide as much surface area as possible that is directly in contact with the salt water because i had instances where my rugosus dump all of her eggs into fresh water and also felix other than perlatus he gave me a gravid cavipes also but then that cavipes uh, dumped all her eggs into fresh water also uh, so that was really really uh, heartbreaking so in the future in order for that not to happen every time I see uh, the eggs are close to hatching I'm going to put the crab in here and one more thing I did was I actually dipped the rugosus straight inside the chrysal and you can see here the zoe hatched and the rugosus actually does the action where it pushes all the zoe out of her shell into the water here if you can just see in the first two seconds or so yep yep there you go so that was successful yeah all the zoe hatched straight into the chrysal and um, not via the spawning tank
but however I realize this practice is kind of forcing the crab to release the eggs I will not use this method again and I will use the spawning tank uh, method instead from now on so this one is probably my best uh, close-up video of hermit crab Zoe I don't have like microscope lenses or microscope cameras or anything so this is purely from my mobile phone camera so let's have a look and that guy in the middle is a baby brown shrimp You can see the body structure quite clearly here. So stumpies uh, is a term I use to describe the underdeveloped zoe that might actually hatch instead of fully developed ones. I don't know why this happened but they are under developed Zoe and it's not clear why yet it may be because it's premature hatching meaning that the parent might try to hatch the eggs prematurely uh, probably around 24 hours before uh, they're supposed to hatch so the larvae hatch but instead of fully realized fully formed Zoe underdeveloped ones are hatched another possibility might be genetics and the percentage of getting stumpies uh, rose when I uh, tried to manually assist the crabs into hatching because my calculations whether the eggs are mature or not might be off so I get way more of this type of zoe uh, why I call them stumpies yeah if you can see uh, clearly there this one here is a fully developed hermit crab zoe and you can see several characteristics uh, one is the pointy nose here and also the hunchback here and you can compare it with the stumpy here this doesn't have a pointy nose at all it's more like a, um, a blunt end here and it doesn't have a hunchback for the stumpies unfortunately they will be unable to swim and uh, actually orientate themselves and will eventually sink to the bottom pretty quickly and most of them will die within 24 48 hours and in these two pictures you can see them clearly uh, the fully developed hermit crab zoe yeah with the characteristic pointy nose and hunchback this one this one this one this one and this one and compared to the stumpies here yeah they pretty much look like clubs yeah that's why I, I call them stumpies so in the future in order to reduce the occurrence of of a spawn getting these types of larvae I will just let the crabs decide for themselves when to dump their eggs into the salt water all right so this is a typical daily schedule for my filter chrysal Just kidding but seriously though um, the whole point of getting a filtered chrysal is to reduce the amount of work of raising a zoe into megalopa and although this is not exactly what I do every day it's pretty accurate every morning the first thing I do is usually go to the chrysal and feed them lunch time or just before lunch I feed them again afternoon around uh, four or five or six i go and feed them again and night time around 10 10 o'clock i feed them again uh, but of course there are other things that you need to do uh, to maintain a chrysal and it's keeping the water parameters in good shape and you do that by changing the water of course 30 to 40 percent about twice a week and this is the big difference because uh, without filters 
you need to change the water at least twice a day. So cutting it down to twice a week is a huge, huge help. And also siphoning out un uneaten food and sheds also twice a week or as often as you want. This is also very important because uneaten food and sheds meaning there are more organic matter in the chrysal and it affects the water quality. And for some reason I find if this regime is not maintained, the zoe, although it is time, they won't actually mold into megalopa. My most successful megalopa molds uh, were actually ones that I was pretty diligent in changing the water and uh, softening out all the gunk inside the chrysal. So in my experience, not all zoe will mold into megalopa if they sense the water is not clean. And also algae. Uh, it's inevitable algae will grow in your chrysal and having algae doesn't mean that the water is dirty but it just looks yucky yeah so if you want to scrub the algae off the chrysal walls be my guest so these four are pretty much the only foods I give to my hermit crab zoe on the left here you got better fry food really finely ground Second one is decapsulated brown shrimp eggs and the grains are actually a little bit too big for the zoe so you have to actually grind it first with mortar and pestle. Next one is spirulina powder which in my opinion the particles are actually too small for the zoe to actually locate and eat. And the next one and I think the most important is live baby brown shrimp and these are the eggs baby branch shrimp you will need to set up a hatchery or two and they take around 24 hours to hatch so i set up two one for the morning feeding and for the nighttime feeding so if you go back here in the morning i exclusively feed the live baby branch shrimp and at night time i also feed exclusively live baby branch shrimp uh, for the lunch time and afternoon feeding, I use the better fry food and sometimes with the spirulina powder also. So the most work relating to feeding is actually setting up the hatchery and resetting the brain shrimp hatchery every day, twice a day. So that's probably where the most effort regarding to feeding comes from. Yep, so you harvest baby brain shrimp after 24 hours in hatchery and reset it again. And I did try to find marine snow and other marine larval food for sale here in Indonesia. Uh, they do sell it, but it's very, very expensive. I think for a bottle, they sell it for $50, so it's just not worth it. Uh, and nanochloropsis, uh, I know Mary uses nano nanochloropsis, which is single-celled algae, but when you use a filter, the nanochloropsis will just get sucked into the filter and, and they just stay there. Yeah, and they don't do the work they, they need to do, which is in the chrysal, uh, acting as constant food for the uh, zoe and also for filtration, a little bit of filtration. Yeah, so nanochloropsis is uh, out of the equation for the filtered chrysal approach. So this video is what I do every night and every morning when I feed the baby brown shrimp for the Zoe. So that's probably about the amount I feed every morning and every night. There, there, there will be uh, more than enough to eat there and um, in, the, in the morning or whenever you have time, you just have to soften out all the uh, excess food in there. They love baby brown shrimp, it's their favorite food. Yep, algae is unavoidable. As you can see, this is how mucky a chrysal can get. Actually, it gets way more muckier than this. And uh, you, you can see here some megalopa also 
in there and uh, as a comparison the right one is the newly scrubbed crystal chamber and the left I haven't scrubbed it yet and the middle chamber is even more grubbier so again having algae does not mean that your water is poor it's just they grow because of light and nutrients in there yeah so um, it looks ugly but it doesn't really affect your water quality oh speaking of water quality if if you're lucky enough to own a water testing kit go for it use it yeah and it should give you more accurate readings of the water uh, quality and uh, what you need to do in accordance to that but for me salt water water testing kit here in Indonesia is very expensive so I just go by ear uh, mostly and I change the water twice a week so this is what you see when you sit in front of your chrysal it's just very peaceful very beautiful and if you see here at the top this zoe here in a few seconds it will locate a baby baby brine shrimp and eat it there you go and you see here every single one of them has the belly full uh, full of orange baby brine shrimp and this is what you look for when you're feeding your zoe full bellies and all happy so 20 days later more or less you will get these guys here that looks really pregnant really orange and really pregnant like compared to the other ones this is an almost sure sign that this particular zoe will molt its final mold into megalopa for some reason they always mold into megalopa at night mostly and if you see some of them looking like this you are sure to get megalopa in the morning yep once again this is the normal zoe and this is zoe with megalopa legs folded under the body ready for final mold so if you see a bunch of them you'll get megalopa and I'm just gonna play this video it's just wonderful these are the megalopas in this case I think this is uh, these are perlatus megalopas you, you can see them very clearly there yeah? the swimming legs and um, they have their little pincers there and I was so happy when I saw them the first time it was just so magical So this is what you get, what you see in the morning when a bunch of them decide to molt into megalopa at night. Uh, you see some of them floating around, but a lot of them will be clinging onto the thin uh, film of algae on the crystal walls. And it's pretty remarkable to see. And they got blue eyes too. And I'd like to point out, if you see like, if you see like, ghostly, um, like this one here, their sheds, yeah, their their skin sheds, yeah, and they're the ones that you need to siphon out, um, probably every couple of days. Very cool. And of course when you get megalopa then you need to have your transition tank ready and for my version this is what uh, my transition transition tank look like the left part here is for the sand the land area and the right side here is for the water and this is what it looks like when it's been set up on the left here you can see this is the water area and there's a little submersible filter there and uh, the incline here which uh, which is glass 
has been silicon with sand so the zoe can grip onto the sand and actually climb up the incline and on the right here it's sand i think mixed with uh, 20 percent of cocoa peat there's some moss pit there and some corals some coconut husks there and i think it's not that different with other uh, breeders tanks uh, but for some reason this is kind of the the extent of my success in raising the hermit crab larvae uh, this is the transition tank side by side with, with the chrysal as you can see the size is not that much different uh, just the transition tank is uh, a lot shallower and a lot wider uh, to have uh, to have the requisite service area for the megalopa to dig down and and do their final mold and become land hermit crabs you can see here the spray bar also of the filter and both of them got uh, lights and as you can see LG also grows in the transition tank and in the transition tank it's more of a problem and you really need to watch out for algae because the algae can actually cover and grows over the the shelves uh, meaning the shelves can't be used uh, for the megalopa to get into and the shell factory if you got megalopa then you will need to provide shelves the thing is in Indonesia there are micro shells but not in Jakarta where I live uh, you can find them really easily uh, from outside Java Island but in Jakarta or in Java it's re really hard to get them so what I did is I made my own <laughs> shell factory which means putting hundreds and hundreds of Malaysian trumpet snails taken from my koi pond the koi pond has tens of thousands of malaysian trumpet snails in it so i just take what i need uh, put them in this small aquarium and also i put in assassin snail like uh, 10 or 20 of them and i just let them loose and the assassin snail will eventually eat the malaysian trumpet snails leaving the empty shells behind so this is what I use for my megalopa shells. So very sorry, Malaysian trumpet snail lovers, but this is what I do. There's a bit of action uh, in, in the transition tank uh, compared to the chrysal tank. And uh, one of them is this. Uh, sometimes you see two megalopas or more trying to eat each other and it's sometimes it's pretty heartbreaking to see because you know only one will survive or often both of them didn't survive because of the injuries and uh, you know you've put so much effort into raising them into megalopas and they once in the transition tank they decide to to do this which is well it's what they do but still you know you you wish that they don't do it <laughs> come on guys break it up so what to feed your megalopa once they're in the transition tank well you can get a little bit more creative uh, and um, in this instance here you can see some of them eating chicken uh, it's raw it's raw chicken here i don't think it's um it's uh, it's a problem if you give cooked chicken sometimes I give salmon uh, other times I give a uh, frozen bloodworm also in this instance it's uh, a bit of blanched uh, spinach spinach leaves and in this video I wanted to give some of the more developed uh, megalopa a helping hand by placing them in a container with uh, empty shells and yes some of them went into the shells as you can see there and after they get into their shells 
some of them will try to climb out climb out of the water into land and you'll get your chance to snap wonderful pictures like this and this one too uh, over the threshold of the incline into the land area and this one uh, walking around in the sand but unfortunately for me this is where where my success ends uh, none of the megalopa that uh, made it into land are successful in their final mold and uh, actually I never see a mold cave anywhere so the problem might be the humidity I think the humidity uh, in the transition tank is high enough but after talking to Sue Brown and Mary too uh, I think I need to get the sand actually almost to the point of flooding and that's what I'm planning to do with the transition tank in the future getting the humidity right up to the point of almost flooding so what next obviously I will continue to try breeding until uh, I'm successful in getting a megalopa to land and actually raising baby hermit crabs just like Mary and uh, a lot of other breeders out there in total I think so far from November 2020 I've had the chance to raise six to seven batches of Zoe and um, every time I learn new things and I learn from my mistakes and um, by learning from that mistakes I can change my approach accordingly and hopefully get better percentage of Zoe uh, making it into Megalopa and into land in the future and I would like to say the title of this talk the lazy breeders guide to breeding uh, hermit crabs is a little bit misleading because uh, although the with the addition of a filter results in significantly reduced workload and without any noticeable negative side effect it is very much a time and attention and money intensive endeavor and it really brings home the uh, amount of things that needs to get right in the wild for a hermit crab to go from egg to zoe and then to megalopa and eventually a proper land crab and you realize how fragile the whole process is where a single missing step is all it takes to derail everything and to the best of my knowledge so far i'm the only one uh, attempting breeding land hermit crabs in indonesia this is, I think, uh, reflective of how land hermit crabs are still viewed in my country. While there are a lot of hobbyists in Indonesia breeding more quote-unquote worthwhile exotic animals like snakes, tarantulas, tortoises, lizards, and other reptiles and amphibians, hermit crabs are, for most people here, still occupy uh, the lowest echelon of the pet industry it is slowly changing thanks to the hard work of people like uh, Felix and uh, many members in our Indonesian group and in the future I would really love it if there are more people attempting breeding other than me and we can eventually set up a network of breeders and uh, we'll be able to exchange ideas exchange bloodlines and such and that would be awesome really and lastly Fingers crossed, uh, we will be able to show the hermit crab industry here in Indonesia that captive breeding is indeed possible and there is an alternative to wild caught hermit crabs. And I think that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much for listening and hopefully you can get something out of this and maybe even consider breeding yourself. Thank you. Welcome to Crustacean Plantation. In 2019, Angela Sayre and her family moved to Tavernier, Florida in the Florida Keys, only to find that they were not the only family in residence. 
Not long after moving in, their, do their three dogs, Jimmy Frank, George, and Martha, started alerting them to the presence of hermit crabs. It was not just one or two hermit crabs, but a plethora of wild hermit crabs. It appears that their home is perfectly situated by an ocean point 400 feet away and protected county land around their home. Hermit crabs use their backyard as a shortcut in their search for shells and fresh water. It's essentially a hermy highway. Angela and family watch over the wild Hermes while they stop by for a drink of fresh water or a snack under the bird feeder. There are also transfer stations set up around the yard to allow for shell shopping opportunities for those looking to upgrade. The Florida Keys is a marine sanctuary, and while hermit crabs are not currently endangered, living in a tourist area, people do love to take home shells as souvenirs of their vacation. Crustacean Plantation hopes to share their story with others in an effort to promote, take a picture, leave the shell, to help preserve wild hermit crabs and their way of life. Crustacean Plantation is truly a wild way station. Here is their story. Please welcome Angela Sayre. Hello everyone. Welcome to Crustacean Plantation. This seemingly simple home that we found in Florida and fell in love with online soon became a home so full of surprises. Having never lived in Florida before, we really knew nothing about the flora, the fauna, and, and kind of what to expect. It was simple enough, a lot of land, which is very unheard of in the Florida Keys, but it would provide us what we, where we currently are now living about almost three years later. Um, as you can see, there was, you know, a lot of the landscape and the coloring that you see now was not there until one evening we find this guy. Sitting in the backyard, obviously the dogs alerted me to his presence. I go out there and I'm like, oh my gosh, not only is that a crab, it's a hermit crab. So I, you know, took a picture, documented it, took it away from the dogs, make sure they didn't do anything with it, let him go on his little merry way, and on he went. Uh, we have three dogs at the time, Martha, George, and Jimmy Frank. And little did we know that it was about to become an adventure. About 400 feet behind our house in the back right corner, sorry, the back left corner of our house is actually the ocean. Um, you know, everything around our yard is, we basically live on coral rock. There's grass, there's not a lot going on there. I started to find these little teeny tiny snails back around the house and also saw what looked to be coral rock. Now this coral rock is, you can see the fossilization in there that also shows, you know, the shells and everything that has to do with the ocean life is literally preserved in the rock itself. This was another thing that we had to get used to. So enter number two. Number two, as you can see, I started marking the shells. And then not much longer after that, my Coast Guard son's like, hey mom, check this out. And there was another little crab. It's like, all right, now we have hermit crabs, we have regular crabs. And then of course, George happens to just grab another crab in his mouth. I realized I was really gonna have my hands full because if the crabs in all of their pinchers and the dogs think that they can pick them up and have them in their mouths, that literally was a recipe for disaster. It just was. Enter number three. This is when I really had grabbed a marker. I went around the side of the house, moved the trash cans, and look what I found. Hermit crabs everywhere, and not just any hermit crabs, large hermit crabs. And it was unbelievable. I just started marking them. There's four. Look at the little hairy legs, the little strawberry feet. I didn't know what I was in for. So there you go, here's six. It's like, oh my gosh, you'll see the date on there, 423.19. It's like, okay, well, maybe if I mark the date and I mark how many there are, 
there's seven, at some point I'll start to see a repeat of some of these guys and maybe help capture as far as how far they're going, what they're doing, have they always lived beside our house, posting these on Facebook to my friends up north in Ohio and in Pennsylvania and Kentucky. They were like, Angela, where in the world did you go? It's like, look at their little hair on their legs. That is the cutest thing ever. But again, you'll see on the date on here, 4-23-2019, that was number eight. Here's number nine, little beady eyes, very dark color, cute hairy legs, and tulip shells. So tulip shells are actually really, they are um, native to our area. And I will say that since this time frame, looking back, uh, I haven't seen a lot of tulip shells since then. This group of guys, whoever they were, and here's 11, they seem to have a monopoly on the, the tulip shells. This was the first time I ever found an empty uh, hermit crab shell. I didn't know what to think of it at the time, so I went ahead and marked it E1, so I can capture the fact that there was nobody living in it whenever I dated it for 2819. A couple other cuties, number 18, 19, they were everywhere, these things. Um, you'll find that this is one of the natives that are along the shoreline. I'll show you more pictures of them here shortly. So since there were so many hermit crabs, I decided to go ahead and get some shells. And I know some of you guys are cringing when you see the painted shells in there. At the time, I didn't know anything about hermit crabs. This whole thing was new to me. So I went ahead and set out some new shells to see what I needed to do. And this is again, back around the corner of the house. Um, we are not actually on the canal, but it's kind of hard to see in, in some of these pictures. I have better pictures later but you'll see some of the rainbow snails that are inside those rocks. You see the brain coral um, rocks that are in there. I mean, all of these things are fossils. They just are. Uh, I think this was one of the first times I ever saw them checking out some of the empty shells. Um, it's really funny whenever I saw this for the first time, I was like, what is he doing? And I don't remember if there was actually somebody in there or if he was just checking out an empty shell for an opportunity to potentially move. Here's number 20, 22. You can imagine my Facebook posts at this time, 23. People are like, oh my gosh, Angela. Oh, here's one of the rainbow shells is what I call them. Um, this is my first clue that the hermit crabs were definitely taking the snail shells from the water area around the corner of the house. 24, they're sitting there hanging out, saying, hey dude, 20, that's probably five and 26. And they came in all sizes. This shell in particular has a decent story to it and you'll see it here a couple more times as we're going through the video. I think this is the one. Um, this was also my first indication when I started looking at how broken the shells were that some of them don't hold up so well under pressure. I just, it amazed me. Oh, this is why they were all coming to the side of the house, literally for water. That is the pipe that has the air conditioning dripping along the side of the house. So they would come over here and come to the end of the pipe and they would get their fresh water. Again, a Google search told me that that's what they were doing. Coming in and getting themselves a little drink. So I thought I would be a helper and get a, a flat dish and started doing a lot of research on Facebook to say, all right, what do I need to do with these hermit crabs? They're coming around the side of the house for water. Is there something special I need to do? I had no idea. There's 32. I seriously, you can imagine this crazy lady running around the side of the house with a Sharpie marker going, oh, there's another one, 30, 31, 33. And Brian's like, are you playing with your Hermes again? I'm like, yes, I'm playing with my Hermes again, 34. You start to see, I didn't even notice it, but looking back now, I see where they've been modifying the shell and you can tell these shells have been used over and over and over again. Look at all the tulip shells. Honestly, I haven't seen, 
looking back now, those tulip shells, I haven't seen any of those guys in a long time. I just haven't. Oh, here's Tick. Look at the dark color of his legs. This guy, I would find him all over the backyard. He wouldn't just stay over on the side where the trash cans were. I would find, because he looks like a giant tick. You'll see him again here in the side. Look at that. It just looks, he was number 37. I would find him everywhere. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? You can't go anywhere. And then again, painted shells. I was like, look, someone finally moved in. Isn't he pretty? Um, I feel bad. I do, guys. I Now I know. Uh, obviously, the painted shells are really frowned upon. Here I am two and a half years later, and I see the painted shells in stores, and I'm like, hermit crabs don't need to have painted shells. That's not natural. But that was number 38. And this was the first time I ever saw a naked one. I didn't understand what was going on. I was like, why is there a hermit crab without a shell and naked? Um, okay. Here's another shell that was, oh, this was number nine that was empty. That's another one that was empty. And look, all of a sudden I'm starting to find dead hermit crabs everywhere. This guy was huge. I just couldn't believe, I mean, he's basically almost the size of my foot. And there's Jimmy Frank tracking, tracking down number 40. This dog was one of the best rat hunters and he adapted and became a hermit crab hunter. It really was the funniest thing you've ever seen. He could find hermit crabs anywhere. So this is a good story here. I work from home. I look over to my left and we live on the second floor. And on my couch is this very large hermit crab. I'm looking around. Again, I work from home. So I'm looking around. I'm like, is this a joke? Did somebody put this hermit crab on here? How in the world did this hermit crab make it to the second story of our home and sitting on my couch? And then I look at the dogs and there's George. He was none the wiser. He literally was sitting on top of the couch and this hermit crab was just inches from him. And believe me, I could not just pick this hermit crab off. Oh no, no, he was hooked on. I actually had to use a spoon from the kitchen to kind of curl it around him to peel him off of the couch. I was like, what in the world did I get myself into moving into this home? But obviously the saga continues. I kept finding them everywhere. No matter what I was doing, anywhere I was going, and I was finding weird scenarios like this. Limbs off, empty shells. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that obviously they were fighting. Obviously there's you know, something going on between each of them. And it was because there were, there was basically a shell shortage. It was their survival for the fittest. And here's a, a flashback to number one. And so this is the tulip snails that are out there around the side of the house, showing you that obviously these are native, again, like I said, to our area. Um, so it's fun to find them, but you're just like, well, some little hermit crab will probably come and take the snail out of there and move in. They'll turn it into their home next. So I just set him down and let him go on his little merry way. Here's a snail. You see the same color of the, the shell that I showed you earlier. I call these rainbow shells. These are obviously different colors and they're fun to find, but these are all snails. So whenever the hermit crabs are born in the waters through here, they will go through and um, pick their poison. Either the rainbow, I call these the little pyramid guys. I find tons of these regular baby hermit crabs in these shells too. So they'll go for the tulips, the rainbow, or the little pyramid guys. Number 33. And again, look at how modified that shell is. This shell has been around the block for a long time. Um, I didn't realize that until later after doing much research is the, how much they modify them. So probably there was a much larger guy in this shell than what is currently, what was currently living in there back in 2019. And you can see he moved out of that shell 
Sorry, I had some of these out of order. Oh, enter more crabs into our lives. Dogs barking in the backyard. I go out there in the evening. I'm like, what is going on? And look at him. Hands raised in the air. Like, have at you, a French man with a sword. And look at this fun gaggle. Someone told me they also like watermelon. So I went ahead and threw some watermelon out there. And some of my favorite guys to find are the teeny tiny guys. When I find them, they're, I will, I'm not, I'm more comfortable holding them. They will obviously sit in your palm. I have had them bite me before. Um, but I think what was interesting, and I can't remember who told me this, Mary, I think it was you that said, even some of the guys this size, did you tell me that they are maybe already one or two years old? So that was a pretty big surprise. And obviously just keep finding Hermes left and right. There they go. Just check them out. Well, one afternoon I heard a ton of commotion and I have a video here coming up that'll show you how much commotion we actually had. Enjoy. Hey, you guys. Hey, 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 hey. What do you find? Frank, watch your face. Hold on, back up. Let me, oh my goodness. Stop, stop you guys. Stop. Hermit crabs in trees. Who knew? First they were in the trash cans inside my house. They're drinking water from the air conditioning. And now we have hermit crabs climbing trees. Why in the world would there be three hermit crabs sitting in a tree, let alone would my dogs find them? This was the craziest thing in the world. I was like, is this real life? It just didn't seem possible. I learned really quickly never to doubt Jimmy Frank. If I saw him standing in the backyard like this, staring off into the distance, he was right. There's something there. You just don't doubt the dog. So with all of the dead hermit crabs I was finding, I decided it was time for me to start. I went ahead and went to Shell World and started buying shells to add to the collections outside. Um, hermit crabs and trees, they obviously take off and, and hide. So I thought, well, I'll start marking them just a little bit differently, just to provide myself with some other type of identifier so I knew the new shells that were being used were different than the old shells. And it didn't take long till all of a sudden I started finding conglomerations like these uh, ordinary snail shells, they will ditch them in a heartbeat. And even later, now when I put out new shells, I will have nothing but a pile of boring old snail shells from here on out. But I love the tiny guys. They are just the super cutest little things I've ever seen in my entire life. And the saga continues. We're now at number 50. I turn the empty snail shells into art, black and white art that is, and moving along. We're finally gonna get to this guy. As you can see from, okay, here we go. As you can see from the shell, I have quite a few different markings on there. Um, I started realizing that I had to notate them a little bit differently. Um, I was actually able to follow how many different hermit crabs kept moving in and out. So you'll see there's different numbers on the shell. It was empty. Uh, there's another date on there. And I realized I can mark the shells all I want, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it goes to that same hermit crab. Now uh, here's George with one of his finds. The dogs are always so proud. They're like, here, Angela, here's a hermit crab for you. I'm like, good dogs. And I let them make sure they step back and I do my little photo shoots with them. And again, crazy lady. Jimmy Frank always looks at me like, um, why are you bothering taking pictures of hermit crabs? You've got this pretty nice little Jack Russell sitting right here in front of you. 
Don't you know that there's a hermit crab right there? Pay attention to me, lady. But if anyone ever saw me running around my backyard taking pictures of hermit crabs all the time, it was definitely an adventure. Oh, here's another type of crab. These are, I think they're called Cuban tree crabs. You can see by the size of the lock, these to the left of the lock, they're just another type of crab that lives around our home. Hence, you can tell where we ended up with the name of our, of our house. Here's Pink Guy. I call him Pink Guy. I used to find him um, in different places all around the yard. Uh, once I found him one time and took some good pictures of him. It's funny, my mom always said that they must know my voice, so they want to sit and hang out with me sometimes, so they stay in the yard. These next few pictures are basically a montage of the continuation of the story. I'm going to let them go through fairly quickly. I do have another story to show you coming up. I was finding them everywhere, a little bit here, a little bit there. I'd always like to use my hand as a form of measurement, or at least my foot, so you can kind of appreciate how big some of them are. Some of them I kind of line up and turn into art, do little photo shoots with them as, they, as I find them and continue moving on from there. Um, but my neighbor across the way, and I have to go back through and take a look at how far away she is. She invited me to join her one day and she said, Angela, I met her a while back. Um, she said, I've never really paid attention to hermit crabs before until you pointed them out to me. She goes, they are all in my backyard. Do you want to come around and let's see how many they are? And she has two little boys and it was super cute as you can see with their little the bucket right here she has a so her yard the trees are closer to her home and she has a lot of rocks around her house and this must have been during the time frame i think what was it april may june july or so there's a huge migration going on and you can actually hear them all through the woods you can hear them like over by her house and her sons were running around with those little claw crab things and picking them up and putting them in a bucket and picking them up and putting them in a bucket. Um, I thought it was neat that way I find them, you know, kind of scattered all throughout our yard, but to see them in a mass concentration like that, this is one of my most favorite pictures from that whole thing. We had so many hermit crabs in this one bucket and when I zoomed in and I saw the color of all of their legs, the colors of their shells, uh, I actually ended up printing this picture out and it's actually a picture on my wall. Um, I mean, it really epitomizes what crustacean plantation is about, just the massive amounts. So what they did is they actually put little dabs of paint on each of their shells and dumped the bucket out and we let them scatter. And I'm telling you, even now, here we are three years later, it never fails to amaze me whenever I pick up a shell that has a little dab of red paint. I'm like, here you go. Here's one of your guys. Number 65. They were literally everywhere. Martha tended to be someone that was more of a protector of them. When she found them, she was really concerned about me watching them and taking care of them. George, he literally would find a shell or a snail and toss it in the air and I would have to take it away from him or he aggressively bites and attacks them. I mean, here you go, you have 68, 69, 70. Every day, 72, 73 was just another one. You'd find them in the grass, you'd find them in the mulch. Here's 76, you'd find them on the other side of the fence. 80, the dogs were like, what is going on? I can't tell that one, that was 82. They literally were everywhere. Here was a naked guy I found. This is probably one of the first times I gave him an option. And you can see he quickly tucked himself away into the shell. And then here, 84, 85, Martha again, being very protective. Broken shells, 88, 89. I think every day, whenever I would post these things on Facebook, again, here's 89.
These guys were everywhere. But the neat thing was to see the shells like this that had the red tip on it. Do you see the ones on the bottom? That's an example. I would call that a carousel. So for carousels, I would take pictures and send them to her and say, hey, I found another one of your guys. In between, I would just go through and find them and pick them up and take pictures and document everything. 96, more new shells to put out. I had no idea how many more I was gonna continue finding, but I love the sizes, I love the shapes. I love turning them into pictures of art, finding red carousels everywhere, new shells putting out, empty shells, 98, 99, Angela, where in the world did you move? What did you get yourself into? 100. 101. They're little cute strawberry legs. 102. I know some of you, again, may be cringing because I'm marking them. 104. But this really was the beginning of my journey. And here we are two years later. I think I finally got around to 108, 109. We started doing more landscaping. 110. And I decided I probably had to give up marking the shells. 112. I think as you can see by that last picture, I had 526 on it, which means I set that shell out around 526. It was a new shell, 114. And these guys were massive. So 526 was the day I put out these shells. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey leave it, leave it. Really? On the fence? Oh, oh my gosh. Yes! And he is so hooked too. <sighs> what am I supposed to do with that, you guys? I don't know. He was literally on the fence. Just stuck there. He wasn't going anywhere. I think I did find him later walking around on the ground, so I had to pick up and document him. Show Frank, look, he's fine. Take some more pictures. But he wasn't the only guy on the fence. I found more. They were everywhere. Anywhere I turned, there they were. Some I had little marks. Like I said, once I got past 100, I really kind of stopped marking them so much except for the uh, occasional celebratory shell. Here's 38, the, the tick guy. Martha is so protective of them. George, like I said, he would toss them, but Martha would actually sit there and guard them from George. I called those my lollipop guys in the mulch and the plants. They would sit there and they would hang out together. The open claws, like again, lollipop. More new shells to set out. And you know, I looking at those tulip shells, I again, I haven't seen tulip shells in Shell World in a long time, but their colors were just so pretty. I would find them and I would offer them upgrades, document them, take their picture, even in trees. I would walk down the stairs in my front and look over to the right, and there they are, in a tree, just right there, sitting there hanging out more new shells. At this point, I think I probably had already came up with a name, Crustacean Plantation. Um, created my own Facebook page, started sharing a lot of my stories, uh, sharing the pictures. Well, if you were a hermit crab, that's a good spot to be. Right, Beaners? Martha. In a tree. But it wasn't just the hermit crabs, it was also the land crabs. They came in a quite a few different colors. There was this blue ones. You'll see some of the the pinchers are pretty big. Such a gorgeous color. And boy, the dogs love finding them. <coughs> the season of the land crabs. Oh my gosh, they were everywhere. The dogs would bark, I would find pieces. Sometimes the hermit, sometimes the land crabs won, sometimes they didn't. And then intermingled with the regular hermit crabs. I love these kind and it's, it's interesting whenever you see um, 
the domestic kind, you talk about shells that aren't proper for them. They will live in whatever you give them. They're happy for their home. This is probably one of the saddest shells that I found that was abandoned. This one's someone's home. I mean, obviously it served them well, but look how worn out it was. I retired this one, it sits by my desk. Tiny crabs, hermit crabs, crabs climbing in trees, crabs fighting over shells, random lizard. They were everywhere. I loved them. I love our little hermy home. The next guy coming up is actually a really crazy story. Uh, if you can see here, he doesn't look much. It doesn't look like he's overcrowded. You can tell he's definitely too big for a shell. But once I started moving the shell around, you could definitely see that there was something crazy here going on. So like any good little hermy mom, I took him and I put him in a pot with a couple other options for him to choose from. And eventually he did make the switch. You have to wonder how long he actually lived like this in this shell. Was he the one that modified it? He did jump over. And here you can see the actual empty shell that he abandoned. When I find shells like this, I retire them. I have a collection of very worn out shells that will never have another owner in them unless something happens to the home. And here he is in his new home. He's happy, he has plenty of room, and he was able to move on from there. Believe me, once I moved, <laughs> once he moved in there, it didn't take him long. And here I go, bye bye little guy. Enjoy your new shell and enjoy your new life. I'm sure he's out there somewhere, way happier than where he was before. Babies are my favorite. They're just so tiny. Literally, I would find these hermit crabs all around the home. This guy is stuck on the side of the wall in the concrete. You can see his pinchers just keeping him suspended right there as if he's on the ground. I'm gonna try to go ahead and take him off the house. Come here, little guy. <laughs> I don't think he'll stick right back, but we'll see. So far you've seen crabs, land crabs, small crabs, everything else going on outside but an iguana in the house just one more thing to add to the adventure okay good catch george just hold on a second griffin 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 what are you doing okay so you got it This little guy is a filler to introduce this next video. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. First time I'd ever seen anything like that in nature. That type of switch, watching them do, I'd read about it, but I had never actually seen it. And capturing it for the first time, again, lizard, sorry for the interruption here. Just never know what the dogs are gonna find. That was, that was actually pretty neat. And of course, here's pieces of crabs. We love living here, we really do. The dogs keep it fun and busy. I'm always taking pictures, little random photo shoots when I find them. Of course, I think if you were to read this hermit crab's mind, he would wonder what in the world is this crazy lady doing? Pulling all of these pictures together into one album in order to create this, I had over 900 and some pictures for the last two, a little more than two years so far. So to put everything together in one video that I was gonna share that was gonna be at least an hour long was definitely quite a feat. So many pictures to share, so many things to introduce you to. I had to really pick and choose which ones I was going to share with you. Looking back at these pictures and all of the land crab pictures that I was able to find, I don't know that I've really seen a season like this since 2019. I bragged a lot about 
what people would see if they came down. But obviously, I mean, they were everywhere. Land crabs were everywhere. In the road, in the front yard. If you're walking to the stairs, they were almost, almost snap at you to bite your feet. Of course, not everyone was successful. Some didn't make it. Some of the dogs won, some of the, the crabs lost. But either way, there was always fun stuff going on. It really never ended. Hermit crabs in the back, hermit crabs in the front, hermit crabs in the trees, land crabs in the landscape, a few black and white crabs. That's, there's no wonder that we actually named this place Crustacean Plantation. It really was the best name for it. When you go back and you look at everything, posting it all on Facebook, sharing it with you guys across the world and across the country. Uh, we picked up quite a few people that we never knew before. Get ready for a stare down, schnauzer style. Good boy, George, you found him. You got him. Way to go, little girl. The fun wasn't just outside, it was also inside too. Can't make this up, folks. I kept hearing this clicking sound down in this area. <laughs> Probably the most fun thing I'd like to do is just pick up the empty shells. And even though I'll put out new shells, I end up with a large pile of leftover ones. Um, eventually, I'll have small guys come in and use them. George found this guy here in the corner on the front porch. Hey. Martha. So we will go safely relocate him. Careful. She's very protective. She's keeping him from the edge of the table. Do you like your hermit crabs? Look at her tail. Martha, they'll get you. Martha never listens. Seriously, guys, this is what you were throwing a fit about? Oh, where'd you go? This is a very beautiful place to live. It is a marine sanctuary. The water is absolutely gorgeous and we do everything we can to take full advantage of all its nature and beauty. My husband and I, we go out boating, kayaking. We love our Keys life. This is a picture of us during our first hurricane. Little did we know that the Bahamas, just to the east of us, were completely getting demolished. We didn't find that out until way later. Obviously, Shell World is one of my favorite places to purchase shells. And of course, never ending fun iguanas in the house. Just how it was. This was our life. Shells everywhere. King tides. If you've never heard of them before, do some Googling. This literally is where water comes up because the moon is high and it floods in our backyard. Jokingly, in maybe a hundred years, I truly will have oceanfront property. Um, so to see the water back here is a bit of a shock. did get away safely. I took care of that. So the hermit crabs found out that I have bird feeders in our backyard. And as you can see here shortly, 
There's actually one on the tree underneath the bird feeders. They do come in at night and eat the bird seed. I thought that was the neatest thing. You know, they're little scavengers. They'll find anywhere where there's food. Meet Alex. Alex found me on Facebook. He had been following crustacean plantation for a while. He also lives in Florida, not far from the Florida Keys. Uh, asked if he could bring his hermit crabs down for a visit from Palm Beach. Showed up with a container. He takes them out often. I remember one's name is Jumbo, and it escapes me what the other two are made. But he brought them and let them wander around. We did find some wild Hermes that were still hanging out in the area. That gave him the, the biggest tickle. As you notice in quite a few of the pictures, I try to only hold the small ones. I have been bit before. It drew blood. It wasn't fun. But even the smallest ones can leave some of the biggest bites. Again, more shells that were broken. Here's a painted one as two. So I hear more of them moving around. But these were the only ones that I found all close by. As you can see, for the most part, they really take advantage of the natural snail shells that are here in the area. But obviously this is a natural shell as well too. That's why I find them there. And then you saw this little tiny guy walking around. There's another natural shell that's in the area. And we'll just put them all back. And once they came, the shells I brought back from Ohio, my grandma passed away and they were in her home and obviously they needed to come back to where they originally came. I cleaned up some of the smaller shells and placed these new ones out here to get a new lease on life. For Christmas in 2019, I actually commissioned um, some Christmas ornaments from Jessica Ann. She's a local artist that does marine life. And I believe she did an absolute amazing job. These were our gifts to all of our family and friends that we had back home. She really did an amazing job. We couldn't have asked for a better commission. So George also liked to dig up hermit crabs. Really, George? Just leave them where they need to be. Don't mess with them. So another fun, neat thing I did was a craft with air plants and shells. Their shadows look like little teeny tiny hermit crabs. A land crab with eggs. After a while of posting pictures on Facebook and establishing the crustacean plantation page, I did start to have a few people reach out to me online and ask me if I would be interested in accepting donations from, you know, shell donations, things that I could put out. Um, some of the local friends here, they would hand me shells saying, you know, hey, I had this one left over in my home. Would you mind sticking this out? A uh, nice lady, of, uh, friend of mine, she was moving and she had a whole collection of shells in a glass jar. And I asked her, I said, Ruth, can I have those? And she was like, absolutely. And they, they would be the perfect hermit crab home. She was, they've been in this container for years. She was like, please let them have a new home. Well, one other person reached out to me online and, you know, like I said, I've heard from different people. Anyone would actually send me shells until one day a box came in the mail. I opened up this box and took a look at everything and I was blown away by this generosity. A um, person had reached out to me on Facebook and asked me if he would mind if I sent him, if he would send me shells. And I said yes and I gave him my address. But when the box actually arrived, I was amazed. Thanks to his generosity and support, I estimate that we put out over 1,000 shells last year alone. Okay, one more video. So explain what I did here. And it's funny, even as I'm going through and moving through everything, I thought I just saw one run away. Okay, so here's how everything works out. This is the new group I just dumped. That's part of the new group. This is old. So these are, this is the pile of empties where people of Hermes have come in, changed them out. And this looks like the leftover pile of 60. 
bees that have yet to be selected. So that's all I can find over here. Um, and I will come back out later and show you guys how much of a mess they make. I can't believe that guy's sitting in the tree still. That's funny. One of the things that I noticed that they would do after they would choose their new shell from these collections, they would run for the trees. They leave their mess behind, scatter their toys everywhere, and then the next thing I know, would start finding them in cute little places up in the trees like this little guy here. And here, it was almost like playing search a word. All in these trees, you would find all of these little hermit crabs. I would call it sleeping it off the next day. In this next picture, you'll see I have five circles. I wish I could pause this to make it bigger for you to look at, but there's actually five hermit crabs in the trees in here. Peekaboo, I see you. Many of my neighbors in our area, um, maybe they've noticed a hermit crab, but they've never really noticed hermit crabs before until I started sharing my stories on Facebook. And now they tell me that they leave out shells too before they go on vacation or anywhere else. Um, and they just get the biggest tickle out of seeing hermit crabs come by, go shell shopping, and go on their merry way. Um, sometimes I'll get a, a Facebook message where somebody from a couple streets down will say, hey, does this shell belong to you? I see this R, what does that mean? And I'll tell them, oh, that's a Ruth shell, or oh, that's a, a Christie shell, or another shell that somebody else gave me. I'll just put an initial on there, and that's what helps me identify all of these different shells or a blade shell, um, you know, where I get them and where they came from. And sometimes some of our other neighbors will also mark their shells and like, this one's not mine. Who does this one belong to? And it's interesting to see how far they travel in our neighborhood. This one was an interesting find. Can you imagine finding this empty shell? Can you imagine carrying this empty shell around with you as your home? This now is part of my retired collection that I have here in the house. You'll never believe this next story. Martha, what do you have? Come on, you're not bringing it inside. Can I have it? Listen. Yep. Poor little guy. You cannot. No. Come on. Go inside. Come on. Go. Go inside. No. I'm going to go put him back. <sighs> George brought a stick in. Go on. Go inside. Go on. <sighs> Putting the hermit crab back. Hopefully we don't make this a thing. Good night, everyone. Bad dog, Martha. Hermit crabs belong outside. We commissioned a local artist to make an official sign for us, and my husband put it up and officially named us Crustacean Plantation. After Amy made our first original signs, I went back to her and asked her to help us decorate more of Crustacean Plantation. I love supporting our local artists, and of course, they love the hermit crab stories that we share. These four shells right here represent the largest majority of the baby ones that we have coming in. Obviously our biggest grouping are these standard snail shells and then of course these little pyramid guys. Obviously these shells are very native here and the little baby hermit crabs just love them. This guy was totally wearing out his decorative shell but once given an option he already made the switch. It doesn't take them long when you find them in these type of conditions and you give them an option, they'll move. They really will. They'll take full advantage of having empty shells ready for them. I love the little spiral guys. Say hi, George. Say hi to everyone. Someone was ready to start their new life with their new shell. i to find um, the original snails in the snail shells. I think that just tells me that the hermit crabs and the snail population are finding a happy balance. It's just not good whenever the hermit crabs are fighting over new shells. Big guy, a pretty shell. Up, 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 up. 
And he's a talker. Look at that. Look at how much the shell has been eaten away. Wow. Sorry. Hi, guy. I see you. Hold on. Let's see if I can get you in a bigger shell, okay? Yes. He never moved. He stayed in his shell, and I eventually set him on his way back out back again. This is a sandbar that's not too far off of our property. It has, you can see all of the natural shells that we are finding on shore and a lot of the teeny tiny guys that they eventually move into. And of course the tulip shells. I think I had to let that one go because it had a somebody still living in it. The one thing I hope to accomplish about sharing our story is to get the word out there about taking shells whenever you go to the beach or if you go visit somewhere on vacation. I don't know that a lot of people realize that yes, a snail or a conch or another marine life animal may no longer be living in that shell. However, as part of a marine sanctuary, there are hermit crabs that live on land that will make use of that shell for their home. And I don't know that people look at hermit crabs the same way they do birds, deer, raccoons, possum, any other other type of wildlife area that maybe lives around them. But living here on the Keys are hermit crabs or scavengers. They have a job to do and they live for a long time. And if people come in and think, oh, the Florida Keys are just so beautiful. Look at this giant shell I found. Let me take this home and put it on my fireplace mantle. That giant shell could have housed a 20 year hermit crab living in the wild, helping to break down things that exist and occur naturally out there. That's anything that I can help share with our story. That's the one thing. Go to and go on vacation, take the memory, leave the shell. We do have marine schools down here for grades K through eight. I hope one day to be able to have crustacean plantation as part of their uh, marine sciences classes. I have spoken to a couple different people. We're not quite there yet as a plantation, but I think once we have everything all set up, I'd like to see if I can include them, the students in coming and learning about hermit crabs and how they're also part of their everyday life here on the islands. You can imagine my surprise when I find this shell, flip it over and see the word high written. I will say I think our hermit crab her little friends are slower this year. And what I mean slower is they aren't seem, they do not seem to be as active as they were the last two years. Maybe it's the lack of rain, maybe it's just the season, or it could be because over a thousand hermit crabs last year upgraded to new shells and now they're all down molting, growing, getting ready to come back out again and see what's available to them. I don't know. I will say something's different. This was probably one of the worst cases of a hermit crab with little to no shell. He literally only had a sliver. His whole bottom side was exposed. He had nothing. This poor guy is in a sliver of a shell. Look, his whole back end is exposed. Let's see what he does. I think it's too big for him. Martha, leave him alone. Martha, leave him alone. Look, come here, buddy. Is that too big for you? Martha, leave him alone. Go on. Ah! Leave him alone. Oh, that's a little bit too big. Let me find a pot for him. I know as soon as I step away, he'll, he'll check it out. Look who changed pants. Hi, buddy. It's a little bit big. Look at, look at this. That's all he left in, just this. At the end of the whole thing, he did end up switching shells. He was way happier 
And I, whenever I did send him on his way, I sent him on his way with a snack. Here's one last example of a discarded shell that was left back in the pile. You just never know what you're gonna find when you walk around here in Crustacean Plantation. I thank you all for spending the last hour with us. Please continue to follow our story on Facebook and on Instagram. And it was a pleasure to join everyone here this weekend at CrabCon 2021. Have a great day. Brenda Casola is a corporate affairs advisor for Chevron. Prior to joining Chevron, she led communications and public affairs for many organizations around the globe, including the Department of Defense, U.S. Air Force, Advantage Technical, and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. She has also worked as a combat correspondent and freelance journalist. Brenda attended Youngstown State University in Ohio for her undergraduate degree and Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for business school. Brenda is an Ohio native who currently calls Houston, Texas home. She is intrigued by the art of communication, photography, storytelling, biology, human progress, good food, and even better human connections. She's a world traveler, frog breeder, and third-rate sommelier. When she's not working or spending time with her pet frogs and hermit crabs, she can be found trying and failing miserably at crow pose, reading true crime novels, or walking her miniature dachshunds Poppy and Winston. Brenda is married to a fellow public affairs professional and has two grown children, a son who is a human resource professional in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and a daughter who is a junior at New York University in New York City. Please welcome Brenda Casola. Hi, I'm Brenda Casola, and I'm honored to be here and to share our rescue story with you as part of CrabCon 2021. Hi, I'm her daughter, Gianna and I will be helping with videography and facilitating the Q&A session. Thank you, Gianna. <laughs> so January 22nd was a really eventful day um, for me. Unexpectedly, we welcomed uh, a bunch of strawberry hermit crabs into our family. Uh, my husband was traveling for business. He travels a lot locally, and that day he was engaging with some community members in rural Texas. Um, he met a man who was a pet shop owner and that man mentioned that he was really busy that day because he had accidentally received land hermit crabs instead of marine hermit crabs which he had purchased for a customer. So he was busy trying to figure out how to care for them, how to set them up, and of course what he can do with them if he's going to sell them or return them to the vendor. Um, my husband had shared with him that his wife loves hermit crabs. We had kept hermit crabs for decades. Um, it all started with my children, which I'm sure many of you can relate. Um, you bring home a crab, you don't know how to care for it, and you learn along the way. Um, at that time, we had two purple pinchers at home, and we were actually looking to adopt and to add some crabs to our family. Um, so he thought it was a great fit, and he offered um, to provide some care, the shop owner said, you know, honestly, I don't really have a market for these crabs. My business has been declining since the start of the pandemic. And he asked my husband to take them home. <laughs> so after a quick text to me to give me a heads up, he was in route with two boxes full of hermit crabs. I luckily had a bunch of spare 10 gallon aquariums. I also keep white tree frogs. I'm a frog breeder and had a bunch of tanks that were empty. So was able to repurpose them to house the crabs temporarily. And so he got home, arrived with two large boxes and I was pleasantly surprised to find that they were strawberries. Um, I didn't know, you know, if we were gonna keep all of them but there were 20 of them. Uh, definitely not prepared for 20, um, you know, crabs that need very unique and specialized care. Um, so we did our best to set them up. 
Over a course of the first couple days, we had a few fatalities. Uh, one was dead on arrival and uh, one died overnight. And then um, two died what, what I guess would be transition stress. Um, they had gone on a long journey and you know once they got to us you know it had they had changed hands a couple of times so you know we did the best we could fed them gave them access to salt water and freshwater pools and they were doing well um, I, I do believe that um, they received these hermit crabs because they had most likely purchased strawberry uh, marine hermit crabs and and that's where the mix-up occurred from and so you know they have continued to thrive and to settle in here we have had 16 remaining after those first couple of fatalities um, and we've moved them into their permanent homes uh, what you can see here behind me is one of those homes it's uh, roughly about 150 gallons and there are 11 strawberry crabs in here and what we decided to do was we lumped the crabs based on size so we have 11 of the larger crabs moved into this tank and then in our purple pincher tank, which is just a bit smaller than this one, we moved the smaller crabs, um, the smaller strawberry crabs in with them since they were similar size. Um, so now I think we're going to take a few questions. Uh, since we have posted our journey online with our rescues, we've received a lot of questions and it, it feels like we answered the same questions quite a bit, so we thought we'd share them here with you at CrabCon. So I'm going to turn it over to my partner Gianna here to ask the questions. Gianna? Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Will any of the crabs be available for adoption? <laughs> Um, no. So <laughs> when we first received them, I was a little overwhelmed. Uh, 20 unexpected crabs, um, especially very large crabs that require a lot of space and a lot of specialized care. Um, the very first thing I thought of was the captive bred breeding program, um, thinking to myself that these crabs are really close to being in the wild, having access to the right lighting, the right food, the ocean water um, so I thought they'd be in peak breeding condition or close to and so I reached out to Mary Akers who in turn connected me with Darcy Madsen who actually lives here in Texas as well about four hours away um, she had some male strawberry hermit crabs and was looking for some females to add to her collection so um, she traveled out here met with us got to see our crabs and we donated two females uh, to crab central station so they are living their best life in a 700 gallon amazing crab habitat and and hopefully they will make babies someday that we can all benefit from so short answer no no crabs are available <laughs> Have you noticed anything funny or strange about their behavior? <laughs> so much, so much. Um, but the one story I have to tell, um, after they were here for the very first day, I decided I wanted to set up my cameras so that I could keep an eye on them. We use the WISE cams. You can actually see them here in the tank. I have three uh, just on this tank. So I repositioned them all so that I could keep an eye on the crabs while they were in their smaller 10 gallon setups. And that first night I was lying in bed and just watching on the WISE app and I saw a naked crab. I had never had a naked crab or experienced one without a shell before. So, you know, I was a, a little bit starting to panic, but then I thought, okay, well, I've seen a lot of cases like this online. So I looked up, uh, just looking for some suggestions of what to do um, on our Facebook group. And luckily I was still keeping an eye on the camera and I zoomed in and noticed he was doing something. So watching him, I could see him using his legs in the saltwater pool as he was perched on the corner of the pool naked. And, and what it looked like, the best way I could describe it is it, like a human if they were washing their laundry, you know, back and forth, up and down, around, and it was his shell. He was moving his shell, rolling it in the water, almost like washing it. And so after about a minute, he jumped into the pool, completely submerged, and within another minute, he emerged from the pool wearing his shell, acting like nothing had ever happened, walked right over to the food bowl, and so from that day on we decided to nickname him Naked Guy. <laughs> 
So he is our naked guy, although later on he earned the name Blaze uh, because of his really striking deep strawberry color. Um, so yeah, that was the funniest story I think that we've we've had so far. Have any of the strawberries molted since you've had them? Yeah, actually, they've all molted. I'm pretty sure all of them. They've they've at least all buried for weeks at a time. Um, the first couple of weeks that they were here, uh, they were very, very active. Nobody really dug down. Um, what I noticed the most the first couple weeks to even the first month or so is that they were roof checking. And what I mean by roof checking is they were they were going to the lid and they were constantly trying to push up on the lid to escape. Um, my, my initial thinking, it, it actually made me a little sad thinking that they were looking for the ocean. They're trying to get out because they wanna go home. And, and I was really sad, like we just took these crabs, they, they ended up coming out of the wild and, and here they are in this tank, you know, albeit a great tank and it's large, it's nowhere near what they would have in the wild. But I noticed that behavior starting to dwindle down and they started to become more content and more relaxed in their tank. And so then they all started burrowing down to molt. Um, but an interesting thing I noticed about their behavior is that they left up one crab. So they all went down pretty much simultaneously, but this one crab stayed up, almost like he was keeping watch over the group. And it was actually Seymour who, I hope he went back in, he was hanging out right here. And of course we started filming and he went away. <laughs> But Seymour stayed up and he seemed like he was keeping watch. He was alert and awake and out 24-7. Um, and so after about a month, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow, which is one of our other crabs, came up almost like to relieve him. And then um, about a week after that, I noticed that Seymour then went down to molt. So it just seemed really fascinating that they would keep one crab up at all times just to be on the lookout, to keep watch, and to make sure that everyone was safe. Um, so they, they've now all taken turns coming up and going back down. I think I have about five up right now, um, but that can change on any, any given day. But they've all at least molted once that I'm aware of. Back in February, Houston experienced record low temperatures and widespread power failures. Were you affected, and what did you do to keep the crowds warm? Yeah, that was a uh, was very, very interesting and tough time for us. Um, you know, we we don't normally have, you know, very cold temperatures here in Houston. It's very much, a, you know, 70 to 100 degrees year round here. Um, so we did know about a day or two in advance that it was going to be record lows. And so we had a little bit of time to prepare. Um, we were without power for about an entire week. It was pretty much four or five days, consistent no power. And then once the power was restored, it was real intermittent. You might've heard the term rolling blackouts. So they'd have us um, you know, on power for about an hour or two, and then they'd cut our power again for about eight hours, and then we'd get an hour or two of power and so on and so forth. During that time, the temperatures in the house dropped to somewhere around 40, 45 degrees. Um, we were able to keep our tanks warm, by using some of the tips that we learned by watching a video that, uh, posted by the Crab Central Station about a day or two in advance of the storm. So what we did initially was wrap the tanks in a Mylar emergency blanket. These are just, a, it's like a little packet that has a blanket in it and you can buy it as part of a first aid kit or in like camping gear. And so we wrapped the tanks in that and then we went around the house and we found every single blanket that we could find that we weren't going to use to keep ourselves warm and we wrapped all of the tanks. Um, in addition to the crabs, we also, like I mentioned, have frogs, um, we had an orchid mantis and we have aquariums with pet fish at the time as well. And so we just wanted to keep all of them warm and comfortable. And so we also had some reflectix left over from wrapping our pipes, which is like a almost like an insulated bubble wrap or similar to a sunshade that you would use in your car on your windshield. Um, so we wrapped the tanks with that as well. That worked for probably about 24 hours or so, but by the second day when the power was consistently out, we knew we were going to need to do something additional. And um, what I found was we had a bunch of containers that look like um, deli containers. They're about 32 ounce containers. I use them to store homemade soup. 
so I knew they were waterproof and I used our stove to boil water poured that water into those containers and then I put them in between the glass and the blankets and used some duct tape to hold them into place so they worked almost like uh, hot water bottles or a heat mat or a heating pad um, to help keep the aquarium warm and that seemed to work I would refill those about every two hours so that the water stayed warm um, during the time most of the crabs stayed buried which it added to my anxiety a little bit not being able to see them and to know that they're okay but I know that sand is a regulator and that's part of how they stayed warm um, or helped to regulate their body temperature throughout the week so I'm happy to report we had no fatalities um, other than a, a couple of our pet fish and I think we have time for one more question so what about shells? These crabs are big, so how do you find the right shells for them? Oh, that, that's a good question. So inheriting 20 crabs all at once, especially large, almost softball-sized crabs, was a real challenge. Um, we weren't prepared, so we did not have a large variety of shells. Um, luckily, I had a few shells that I had received or ordered over time that were too big for our purple pinchers, which ended up being a good fit for the strawberries. Um, so I, I did just went online and just bought from every vendor that I could find that was part of our online group's approved seller list. Um, but that, that first day, which is really interesting, uh, Seymour, who I mentioned earlier, he actually came with a hole in his shell. And it was a pretty sizable hole, not like a pen tip, but more like a, an actual eraser tip on a pencil. Um, and so he changed almost immediately into a carved turbo shell. But the interesting or funny thing about it was all the other crabs that were in that tank with him at the time lined up next to him while he was evaluating his new shell. And I, I got a little concerned because I thought, well, maybe this is a sign of shell aggression. So I watched from a distance just to observe the behavior. And what he ended up doing was, you know, he rolled it around, checked it out, and he moved into that shell. When he discarded his shell, the others took turns looking at his shell. So they looked at it, they rolled it around, you know, one even tried it on actually. Um, but by the time they were all done evaluating it, they discarded it because obviously it had a hole and it wasn't useful for them to store water and food inside their shell. Um, so yeah, that was a pretty interesting um, thing to watch to see them developing those family and, and pack dynamics. Um, they're very social creatures and that's uh, one of the things that we've really learned through these last six months of having them is that they really, really do communicate with each other. Um, they get along for the most part. I've only seen one sign of aggression and I don't even know that it really could be deemed aggression, but Blaze uh, was at the top of a piece of chala wood and Seymour was approaching and he just took his feet and went like this and shoved Seymour and Seymour rolled right back down the, the chala. It was, it was funny to watch and Seymour was fine, but you know, they, they fight just like siblings, <laughs> but it was super cute. Um, but I think that's all the time that we have. I thank you for watching our video and for coming into our home and seeing our Kravitat and hearing our rescue story. We're honored and proud to have these guys in our lives. They bring us so much joy and they brighten my day every day. Um, this is my office. I work from here. So, you know, it's nice. I get to just look over and, and keep an eye on them throughout the day and it, it brings me a lot of joy. So I hope watching this video has brought you a little bit of joy and made your day brighter today. Enjoy the rest of your crab con. Bye. Marion Trailer was born and raised in Virginia, but moved to the Gulf of Florida last year. She is mother to four grown kids, two grandkids, and ten hermit crabs, six adult and four captive bred babies. Hermit crabs are her only pets, and she adores them. Her hobbies include sightseeing, traveling, kayaking, and watching her husband play competitive softball all over the United States. Most people are surprised to learn this about her, that she used to drive a tractor trailer for her job and was the only female on the East Coast to haul superloads, 
which consisted of hauling 200-foot bridge beams that weighed approximately 300,000 pounds. Please welcome Marion Trailer. Hi everyone, my name is Marion and I want to let you know that I am super excited to be a part of CrabCon this year. My presentation is going to be on the wise cameras and the crab attack, which is something I am extremely passionate about. If anybody has seen any of my videos, you'll see that um, you know I love to record and do the playbacks and post them on Facebook, and I get a ton of you know really really awesome comments. So I really appreciate that. If you don't have a camera yet. Hopefully, after this presentation, you'll get one. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about WISE. I know there are a lot of different cameras. Um, I personally have only used a few, and my preference is WISE, but I know there are other cameras that really work for people. WISE is just my preference. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the camera itself. I'm gonna show you where I place mine, and then I'm going to show you some of my own personal videos that I've made. So starting with one thing I would like to address, I know a lot of people have concerns about installing the camera inside their tank. I have both of my, I have two tanks. Um, this is my captive bred baby tank. It's a 40 gallon. I have my camera mounted up here in the corner. I also have a 75 gallon with my adult crabs and I've had that camera in that tank for uh, two, a good two years. The same camera, um, it's just the standard, it's not the outdoor camera, it's the indoor camera, um, but it's been in that tank for two years. Actually, this, I took it out <laughs> just for this presentation for today. Um, I don't know if you can see, the camera is a little bit discolored because it's old it's two years old but it has been in my camera or in my crab attack for two years and no rust no issues I don't have a cover on it and it's inside my tank so no issues I will say if you do install your camera in the tank make sure you don't put it anywhere near your pools especially if you have bubblers because it puts out a, a really fine mist that's kind of hard to see but it's there and you don't want to take a chance of the camera being over top of that you know that mist um, and damaging the camera or rusting or, or anything like that so whenever I install my cameras I just make sure that they're away from the pools and before anybody asks I we've been experimenting with real pools for the babies um, they really don't want any part of it yet, so we use, still are in the reptile dish stage. They haven't upgraded to the pools yet just because when I put them in there, they completely avoid them. So anyway, um, this is strictly a baby tank. So I don't have to worry about, you know, the spray from the pools because I'm just using the reptile bowls right now. But eventually they will have real, real pools. And at that point, then I have to do worry about the placement. Um, okay, so... Let's see, um, I live in Florida on the Gulf Coast. It's very super humid and hot here, like similar to what the crab habitat is. Um, so I just always never, I would never was concerned about the, the temperature and the humidity. So that's just me. I did try when I first got the camera to mount it outside the tank, but there was too much of a glare. So I gave up and put it inside the tank and haven't had any problems with either one. This camera I've had in the baby tank for about a year now. Um, some people have an issue with the cord because it is not a wireless camera, but the cord is super flat. And so I'll show you in a minute, but I have a glass lid. It closes just fine over this, you know, super flat cord. Um, so that is not an issue for me. If you want to record, you do need to get an SD card. You can get those for a couple of bucks. The camera is about $24. It comes in this cute little box. And oops, this is the camera. It comes with 
this little metal or a magnetic ring that goes on the bottom and then you have a little mounting strip so you could use this if you want to attach the use these pieces that come with it to attach it to your tank um, I personally haven't used these because I read that they're really permanent um, because I, I guess they hold super well or whatever so instead I use velcro I like the little squares because four of these squares will fit right at the base of the 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 camera um, so I like this these velcro things I got these at big lots you can get them at Walmart or wherever um, this is a pretty low maintenance camera so you get the camera the cord the little attachment piece if you want to use that I just recommend velcro because you can put a different a bunch of different velcro piece, pieces in the crab attack and you can move it around whenever you want to very easily um, but it's a pretty low maintenance card or a camera there are what I found over the years is a lot of benefits to having a camera in the tank first off um, you can watch the crabs you know 24 7 because there's a live stream feature you can see some of the what the crabs like and dislike um, you can find like little troublesome areas in your tank I know when I first set up my baby tank because they love 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 to climb I did notice that there was one spot that all of them kept falling off of and I, I didn't want them to get hurt they were you know so so tiny that I did fix that right away so I loved having that feature or you know just being able to watch them when I'm not at home so I can find you know the little troublesome areas like that uh, you so it has a live stream feature you can also record and you can pick any time period that you want to record a lot of times I'll start recording in the afternoons and record all night and then when I watch the playback because it's in that fast speed um, it only takes like two or three minutes to watch a complete 10 or 12 hours of recording so I love that feature as well you can also file share anyone that has a wise account can um, have access to my um, camera you can give me access to your camera we you know can see each other's cameras all the time so I have a few friends that I file share with one of my best friends in my old hometown of Virginia when I moved last year you know that was one of the things I was so upset about was having to leave her because we had you know the hermit crab thing in common and we help each other with tanks and you know all of this and then when I left it was great because now even though I can't see her I can still see her crabs so uh, and actually recently I just got her um, or last year I got her some shells from the shell store and one of them was carved with Florida in it because that's where I live now and um, her crab is wearing the Florida shell so I get to see him sporting his new little duds on camera so that's kind of cool but anyway I, I will show you um, you know how to do the file sharing or, or show you how you know who I file share with and things like that um, it's just neat neat being able to see other people's crab attacks and, and things like that so um, WAS also has a night vision and it's automatic so if you're recording during the day and it records into the night as well once the lights go out it automatically switches to that night vision and it is a you know super super um, clear easy to see picture it is really nice it it's like black and white or gray and white or whatever it it is but it's um like super easy to see so that automatically changes over after my presentation i'm going to show you some of my own personal videos and you'll see i'll make sure that i'll show you some that go from day recording into the night recording so you can see how it changes over it's a really really neat feature so I love WAS. Like I said, if you don't have a camera in your tank, I strongly recommend it. Okay, now I'm going to show you where I have my camera placed in my tank. Oh, and I have a little baby on the wheel. Um, 
So it's in the top left corner. I have a little suction cup here because it wanted to fall a little bit, but it is mounted with Velcro to the glass. And it does have this little cord, but it's flat, so you can see it doesn't leave a gap at all. It fits perfectly under that lid. Um, I'm disturbing the babies. One was having a blast on the wheel, and now he's trying to book it to get away from me, but he's adorable. And then I have one was eating, and I've disturbed him as well. There that little cute thing is. Okay, so here is my camera mounted on the side, and it's basically pointing down inside the tank, like in that direction. Um, I pretty much designed my tank around my camera because I wanted to be able to see everything. Um, so that's kind of the view that I get with the camera. Um, I have my wheel turned just a little bit so that I can see it better. Can't see them too much when they're over here in their water dishes, but I can see them, you know, when they climb these logs, when they change shells, when they're in this little tree that they absolutely love, or on the reef, and then on this pole that they zoom back and forth on all night. So I can see when they're on this ladder, when they're in here, eating their flowers and leaves. And then when they're on these log pieces, they really love that. Um, they also, of course, love the wheel, but he's really running somewhere to get away from me. I don't know where he thinks he's going, but he's adorable. So I'll leave my presentation here and now I'm gonna show you some additional features of the WAS camera, as well as some of my um, personal videos that I've made with my camera. Here is the main Y screen and it shows my tanks as well as any shared tanks that I have access to. This screen has additional options for motion tagging. So if you wanna be notified when there's motion, you can set it there. You can look at any pictures or videos in your album. And also the time lapse feature is where you set your recording start and end times. Now you do have to set the start and end times every time you wanna make a video. This video was recorded with my tank camera and it's in, you know, regular speed, I guess like the live stream um, of my adult crabs all trying to gang up on the wheel at one time.
Mike and Missy Vacoder have lived near Sarasota, Florida for 20 years and have been involved with hermit crab rescues and advocacy for about 10 years. Their first two hermit crabs were from a local pet store that was going out of business, and from those two crabs their love for hermit crabs grew. They foster hermits through Reddit, Hermit Crab Association, Crab Street Journal, and various other groups. Through Crab Street Journal, local schools and teachers, the Humane Society, and their children's friends, they have been able to find homes for over 300 hermit crabs in need of new loving forever homes. They would like to thank all the adopters and caring people that donate their personal money, resources, and especially their precious time in helping hermit crabs in need. Mike and Missy also own three parrots and foster many others. During this presentation, you may hear some of them in the background. Please welcome Mike Vukoder. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Vukoder, and I'd like to welcome you to this portion of the 2021 CrabCon. I'm sure many of you have read the short articles and seen the videos about Jonathan over the years. I often wondered what it would be like to have a big hermit crab walking around my house. Little did I know that a few years later I would actually get that opportunity. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the time that we had spent with Jonathan Livingston Crab in the summer of 2019. Since most of us keep our hermit crabs in the tank and don't let them cruise around our house all the time, we thought it would be fun just to share our experience and kind of show everybody, give them a little glimpse into what it's like having a giant hermit crab live in your house and roam freely. Initially, we got in touch with Carol Ann Orms, that's Jonathan's owner, through Stacy Griffith with the Crab Street Journal. Stacy sent us an email asking if we had any larger size shells for Jonathan because, as Carol put it, he was going to be in a pickle soon if he didn't find any bigger shells. Unfortunately, we didn't have any shells even close to Jonathan's size. Everything we had was about two inch openings maximum. So we let Carol know that we would do our best to find him larger shells and we would not be back in touch with Carol until January of the following year. In January, I called Carol uh, just to find out how Jonathan was doing and how she was making out with the shells. And we ended up having a two hour conversation about hermit crabs. During the phone conversation, Carol Ann let me know that she was going to have some surgery done at the beginning of April and that she would be off her feet due to physical therapy for a few months afterwards. She asked if we would be willing to watch Jonathan for a few months, uh, depending on how long she was gonna need to recuperate. And of course we wholeheartedly agreed. Uh, I had read about Jonathan and he was one of the reasons that I got into crabbing in the first place uh, so seriously. And there was just no way that we were gonna say no to this opportunity. In the middle of February, we drove down to see Carol and get a little bit better idea of what type of enclosure he was kept in, what types of foods he was eating, how he was being kept, uh, and just met Carol in person just to go over the basics of Jonathan's care and that way I could get back home and get the preparations going. In our initial visit with Carol, she also let us know that she put Jonathan in his molt tub. Uh, it was just about time for him to molt. So another concern that we had was that would Jonathan be done molting before we had to transport him back to our house. We set up a 55 gallon tank for Jonathan. It had a saltwater pool, a freshwater pool, two cork bark rounds large enough for him to go down into and bury in. Uh, we filled them both with leaves and moss. The idea was to mimic the enclosure that he was kept in at Carol's all these years. And we just wanted to make sure that we gave him a little bit more room 
because our schedule was not going to allow us to have Jonathan out as much as Carol had. About two weeks before we were due to pick up Jonathan, Carol had sent us an email and let us know that Jonathan had shed his exoskeleton. This was great news. We had been waiting for this. You can see he's a bright, fresh lavender color here, uh, and he is ready to chow down on that exoskeleton. About one week before we were due to pick up Jonathan, Carol sent us another email and let us know that Jonathan's molt was going well. He was starting to turn really dark. He had eaten a good substantial amount of his exoskeleton, and it looked like he was going to be ready to go for uh, the transport to our house. Finally, the big day arrived at the beginning of April, and I drove down to pick up Jonathan. Drive down takes about an hour and a half, and I'll be honest, this is when my nerves started kicking in and my anxiety as well. I started to wonder exactly what I had got myself into. The look on Jonathan's face pretty much sums up how I felt on the inside. But Carol was very reassuring. She let me know that Jonathan was old and that if something should happen, it was just his time and that I should just treat him like I do any of the other crabs and not to worry about it and everything would turn out okay. Before I took Jonathan home, Carol was gracious enough to share a bunch of pictures with me of Jonathan through the years. I love the picture of Kate and John up in the tree. It really was a little bit of foreshadowing of what I could expect with a hermit crab walking around my house. I was also fortunate enough to get to see the original shells that Jonathan and Kate had when uh, Carol had brought them home back in 1976. After a quick picture with Jonathan and a quick crabby hug from his mom, we loaded him up into his transport container and I headed down to the car. While I was loading him up, a nice gentleman neighbor of Carol's came by and he wanted to let me know how much the crab meant to Carol and that I should take really good care of him. It really goes to show how much everybody in Carol's community cares about Carol and Jonathan and they're always looking out for him down there. After the ride home, which gave me even more time to ponder what I had gotten myself into, we arrived at the house safe and sound and Missy let Jonathan out of his travel tub. As you can see, he's just about done molting and he is an enormous hermit crab. On day one, we just wanted to get Jonathan back home into his new environment and just let him relax and get used to his new surroundings. Uh, so we did that and you can see here he's eating some of his exo that was still left over from his molt. He didn't have too much left, I would guess about a teaspoon or so. Carol had let us know that he had pretty much eaten all of his exo and that he was a little bit lethargic and off from his normal self, but it shouldn't be too long until he was ready to go. Before I get into the day-to-day -day life and the activities that we did with Jonathan, I wanted to explain a little bit about the food that Carol had sent home with us. You can see uh, freeze-dried shrimp. There was a hermit crab treat, which was tropical fruits and a little bit of sea salt. There was also a calcium supplement, uh, some green sand from Crab Street Journal, uh, worm castings, and a natural mineral supplement, which I assume was azomite, but I didn't try it to find out. The eight and a half by 11 paper picture is not a mistake. Jonathan really, really loved to eat paper. Uh, Missy had caught him sneaking into the office a couple times in our shred pile, and he was just tearing paper up. So you may see eight and a half by 11 paper in some of the pictures, and that's because Jonathan just loved to snack on it. After we were comfortable that uh, Jonathan was not stressed out and he was uh, pretty settled into his new environment, it was time to let him out of the tank 
and let him cruise around the house. He seemed pretty excited to get out of the tank and started cruising over to all the larger shells that we had. You could see that our bird was really keeping a close eye on Jonathan. They were never very comfortable with that big crab walking around and they always kept a close eye on him. Jonathan really seemed to take a keen interest in the uh, new shells. Uh, Carol had warned us that he was on the lookout for a new shell. So uh, we were really treated when he started to look over the shells, measure them, and then he began to change shells. Now Jonathan had already taken about 10 or 15 minutes to check out the other shells and he decided to settle on this banded jade. Being so large, you really get a good view of what all those little arms and legs are doing in there. I had expected Jonathan to change shells at some point, but for him to change shells here on the second day was a real treat. Uh, it, it was really amazing to be able to witness this in person. I was also glad I actually had my phone on me so that I could take a video. Uh, unfortunately, after his vacation, it just turned out that I didn't take as many videos as I wished I had. So this was a lucky treat. Right about now, he is in that shell. And at this point, I was thinking, all right, this is, this is great. He likes the shell. Uh, you know, he should be ready to get up and move around and check it out. But I was completely wrong. With no other crabs around for competition, Jonathan decided to take his time and do a few final measurements here. It's actually pretty funny. I, I don't know what he was thinking here, but uh, he messes around a little bit more with this shell before he finally decides, okay, this thing's good enough. Here he's just kind of pushing that shell out of the way. Looks like he's doing a few minor adjustments inside the shell, getting him sort of turned around the right way. And then he is ready to start cruising around. Pretty cool. After Jonathan walked around for about a half an hour, I put him back in the tank. Uh, I was worried because he had a new shell and he was going to need some water to fill that up. And I also wanted to make sure that he was uh, pretty happy with his new shell. After a few final measurements and a little bit of checking there to see you know, if this was going to work or not, he went over to his favorite mirror and checked himself out. Carol had sent this mirror home with me and let me know that it was one of his favorite toys and it had to be in his tank. And sure enough, he really enjoyed it. We also put a uh, disco ball in his tank mainly because it, you know, it's shiny and just like the mirror. And sure enough, he loved that thing too. He was always batting it around with his legs or staring at it. It was pretty humorous. Carol had also sent me home with one of Jonathan's favorite rocks pictured here. I was a little skeptical about the rock, uh, about as much as I was about the eight and a half by 11 paper. But after a few days of watching Jonathan, I noticed that he really did enjoy hanging out on that rock, and uh, I usually caught him sitting on top of it. When Jonathan was in his tank, one of the favorite hide spots of his was down in this big cork bark uh, hide. I would put damp moss in there for him to hide, and he would go down in there all the time. Uh, that's really where he'd love to sleep. I even sent uh, uh, this exact cork bark home with Carol and she shared pictures with me over the next year or so of Jonathan sleeping in that thing all the time during the day. So he really, really enjoyed that cork bark hide. While Jonathan was spending time at our house, I had made an arrangement with the Humane Society in Pinellas County to visit them every Tuesday for about an hour and talk to the kids about hermit crabs and teach them about our native species down here in Florida. I had gotten the contact information from Stacy Griffith at Crab Street Journal and it really turned into a great opportunity uh, and experience for the kids to uh, learn about hermit crabs and get to meet and interact with the world's oldest hermit crab. Jonathan was able to accompany me on these trips with Carol's permission, 
and he was the perfect ambassador for hermit crabs. Every time I would bring him out, all the cell phones would come out, pictures were taken, and that's when the questions really started. Even the teachers would come from different buildings to uh, check him out. Nobody could believe how big he was or how old he was. So it was a real treat. Uh, at the end of the camps, I think we reached over 140 kids. So uh, it, Jonathan was just amazing on all these trips. He would walk around the tables and he was just the perfect ambassador. During normal days, whenever I would uh, get up in the morning and turn the light on in the tank, this is usually how Jonathan would greet me. He would start moving his legs around and hitting the tank. And I believe that was his signal that it was time to let him out of the tank and for him to get moving. On another occasion, Missy and I had made a road trip around Florida for about three days and picked up about 12 hermit crabs that we had rescued from different people. Uh, Jonathan was super curious about these little guys. He was right up against the tank wondering what was going on. Uh, we had let a couple of them out on our lanai and Jonathan followed him around and then he went on his own business. Uh, he was just a curious guy, always wondering, you know, what we were doing, what's going on, what's all this new stuff around. Here's a close-up picture so you can get an idea of just how big Jonathan is. Uh, he's next to a one-inch opening hermit crab here, a little small guy, juvenile still. You can see he's 10, 20 times as big as that, that little crab. Here's another picture just to get a little bit of scale and uh, try to understand how large he was. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan's shell was as wide and as tall as a 12 ounce can of soda. So he was, he was a big boy. Jonathan also seemed to like TV. Uh, I don't know if it was the flashing lights or the movement that caught his attention or possibly he's just a huge hockey fan. But I did notice on many occasions that I would catch him just staring at the TV. At one point, I had to make a tank up for a science teacher, and of course, Jonathan was right in the middle of it. As soon as I brought the stuff out, he walked right over to make sure that I was building it up to uh, correct hermit crab specs. At one point, we decided to see how Jonathan would react around other hermit crabs. Missy and I have a very large crab named Goliath, and we thought the two of them would be perfect uh, to see exactly, you know, how their interaction would be if we put them together. Jonathan hadn't been around another hermit crab for about seven years, so we weren't exactly sure what to expect. There was a lot of antenna bumping and gesturing, but overall Jonathan didn't seem to be too concerned about other hermit crabs. Uh, he would just do a little meet and greet and afterwards just go about his business uh, in a separate direction. I never did leave him alone with another crab for any amount of time, just uh, due to his safety. But um, he seemed to be pretty receptive to uh, other hermit crabs. We tried to take Jonathan outside as much as we could on our lanai. That's basically like a screened-in porch. Uh, he also really enjoyed it at night. Uh, he would go out there and we'd give him bananas and some water to drink. Carol had told me to keep an eye on him and make sure that he didn't tire himself out. And that usually was the case. He would walk around for a few hours and then I would find him just sort of resting somewhere. And that was my signal to go ahead and put him back in the tank. It may have been that Jonathan was restless to get home, but you can see that he had torn down all of the uh, green plants that I had put in the tank. Uh, he wasn't really eating them, but he just kept tearing them down, and I kept taking them out until finally there was just nothing left. Jonathan even managed to put a hole in one of the uh, shells that we had for him. Uh, he wore it around for about a day until he finally switched to a uh, non-destroyed shell, but uh, yeah, that was a little bit disappointing. There's only so many of these large shells that uh, I had on hand, so... Everyone was precious, and it was unfortunate that he put a hole in this one. This was my favorite shell that he wore. 
Uh, it's just a banded jade, but it had the little knob sticking out on it still, and it fit him really well. The shell just seemed to fit his personality. I don't know why, but the blues and greens and the pearl, and he fit perfectly inside that shell, and he walked around like he was a king in that thing. With about two weeks left before the end of Jonathan's vacation, I took a trip with our chinchilla Rufus and Jonathan in tow down to Carol's place just to she, uh, see how she was doing and if she was ready to have Jonathan back home again. Rufus and I had a lot of fun on this trip with Carol and her neighbor Julie. Uh, Rufus got so much love that day and he slept the entire ride home. Finally, the day arrived that I had to pack up Jonathan and take him home. I'm not sure if it was coincidence or not, but Jonathan started getting a little bit active as I pulled into uh, Carol's complex down there. I also breathed a huge sigh of relief that he made it back. Of all the pictures I took, I, this was definitely my most cherished. Uh, I think it just encapsulated perfectly Carol and Jonathan and the relationship that they had. I was just sitting on the other couch talking to Carol and Jonathan's walking by and everything just seemed so normal around there. And at this point, I pretty much understood it. So what exactly did I learn from all of this? First, I learned if you let a hermit crab out in your house, they are going to disappear if you don't keep an eye on them. They are expert hiders, and once they hunker down, they are extremely hard to find. And if you're really lucky, you may even find some brown frowns laying around for you. I also learned that you need to have the proper shells. My shell game was not very good. Uh, throughout the video, you can see Jonathan switch shells seven times that I counted. Uh, he was just never satisfied. A couple months after I had taken Jonathan back home, I managed to get my hands on 24 of these beautiful banded jade shells, of which only five were in his size. I took the shells down to Carol and we sat on the floor and watched Jonathan check them over. He didn't switch that day when I was down there, but uh, I think Carol told me he switched a few days later into one. Uh, he seemed really happy, so that that was a real bonus there to get him into a shell that actually fit him. The last thing I wasn't prepared for was all the generous gifts from people from all over the world for Jonathan. He received custom-made food dishes, some really awesome shells from South Korea, as well as poems, cards, emails, texts, all wondering how Jonathan was making out. It was really amazing to see how many people all over the world knew about John uh, outside of just a small group of crab people that I knew. It's really amazing and uh, pretty impressive. Thank you all for uh, taking the time and watching this today, and I hope you enjoyed it. Jeannie Singhas is an LHCOS moderator and Crab Street Journal local rep. She has been crab keeping for over 25 years. She started foraging for her crabs after joining the Land Hermit Crab Owner Society five years ago. Her goal is to offer fresh natural food and enrichment for her wild caught crabs and yours as well. Her business is Because of Crabs, Moss and Such, and can be found on Etsy.
welcome to putting it away for winter. Let's begin. Well, as you know, I have my um, moss group because of crabs, and I sell several items. Uh, right here I have the moss, very famous moss. There it is. And lichens, dried leaves, and lots of spring flowers in this box. The, um, this is rye that grew all winter, dried, and I harvested it. Containers for putting it away for winter. Over here we have logs, branches with lichens or, and with moss. This basket, bark, and branches. Now, as far as the bark, you can gather this summer or winter. It's best if it doesn't have moss or lichens to bake this at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes to kill any parasites. If it has lichens and moss and you want to preserve those, you can pour on or soak in boiling water. That doesn't mean boil it. You can soak it in boiling water and or freeze it for 48 hours. After you've cleaned, if you don't put it right in, you can wrap it in brown bags or put it in cardboard boxes. You are going to have to check for parasites again when you do go to use it. Mice, you know, they can get on there. They're everywhere. This bark in the front, same thing. This would go in the oven. No moss or lichens. All this bark in the front. All this is for sale, will be for sale on my Etsy. That's a hide. Same thing. Maple, most of that. Um, yesterday we found a couple garter snakes in, in the uh, our building. And they gave me this snake shed. Now for this, you could just toss the uh, in the freezer or in your de uh, dehydrator to kill any parasites. These, can you see from there, Woo! are cicadas. We have a good mini here. This is just their exoskeleton. They're ready to go. I mean, if you want to store those, there you go. Little container from the dollar store. Like, I think you get like six for a dollar or two. These racks here, you see, I could have put something on that one. These are for a dehydrator. But I don't always use the dehydrator to dry flowers. These were all air dried. On these racks, in the sun, you can do this in one day. If not, it could take about a week. This is uh, roses, dahlias, and blackberry raspberry leaves. These are from earlier in the spring. These are lilacs. Also, these were all air dried out in the sun. These roses are not dried. These were just picked yesterday off of my rose bushes. There's yellow, white, uh, pink, and red. They would just sit in this rack and dry. We get put these on here. I picked these in early March. There are dandelions, um, henbit, oh, just all kinds of spring flowers, violets, quince, and they've been drying on here. They're totally dry. Also, this isn't dry. These are, if you have briar patches or blackberry or raspberry or wild roses, the crabs eat both the leaves and the flowers. And these also will sit on this rack or in a cardboard box. That's cardboard. I use a lot of cardboard boxes to dry flowers. It absorbs the extra moisture. Let me move the rye. The rye, to store this, you could put it in a brown bag. Or you could take your scissors, your shears. And go ahead and prepare it. Just cut it up. A little stiffer than a 
expected. Okay, so, for that, the Ziploc bag or a brown bag, take it, put it down in that bag. If you can't remember what you put in there, you can write on the bag. But there it is, all sealed up. Now that should keep her sights out. This I just had in the sun. It dried on its own. You could toss this in the freezer in this bag and it won't get wet. And it will kill any parasites. So that's the rye. You could do that with wheat or barley too if you have it. See up here, this had deer poop in it. I left it open. Poured it in there when it was wet. And it just dried on its own. And every once in a while, I'd shake the box up or dump it into a larger cardboard box like this one to dry outside. Um, this is a strawberry container. Perfect to, to do that. But to store this, I'm not touching it. If you were touching it, you need gloves because it is poop. To store it, I store it in the cardboard box. And then I just close it up. You can write on it what it is. This, I have a friend at work, has rabbits. She has bunnies. And the bunnies poop. And she gives me the bunny poop. I put it in here. I'm not going to touch that. It almost did. I dump it in here. See the little, it looks like cocoa puffs. That's perfect for that to dry in. And again, to store it, you can use a Ziploc bag. Or again, at the dollar store, they have these little holiday bowls every summer, Easter, holiday. You get like four for a dollar. Once it's dry, pour it in there. Too much. It's good to go. Also, mason jars. That'll take a lot of poop. Save your jelly jars. This one had chow chow in it, but I cleaned it. Dishwasher. So, chow chow jars, jelly jars. This is a cheese whiz jar. Even the moss and lichens. If you wanted to store this, you could probably pick all this stuff out. This one's still damp, so I wouldn't put it in a plastic bag and not and seal that up. But a lot of people, you can put moss into a mason jar. If you wanted to and you could actually dampen that to keep that green or you take it put it in a paper bag or a cardboard box leave it open it'll last three to six months or even longer uh, you can also freeze it but I usually generally let it dry out it doesn't has never died on me I've had it three to six months without being in a tank and no problem but like if you can if you put it in a plastic ziploc bag like when i send them to you it will have holes in it that is to allow air in it shouldn't mold that's not saying it won't if it's airtight and you live in a human environment right now a lot of us do it's getting warm out finally if you put it in any of those containers you're also going to need uh, air air vents air holes you can use pencil boxes. Just don't close it tight. And, and light still gets in. Just don't don't snap it. These pencil boxes. Oh, got an ant. No, no, ant. No. You could store almost anything. Let's say you want flowers in here. Because you want the flowers to stay dry. This is not going to seal perfectly. So... They'll stay nice and dry. And there you go. My The reason I came up with how to store this stuff for winter, my first year or two of finding an Ann Hermit Crab Owner Society, I realized, yeah. now I have no flowers. The flowers have all froze. They're all dead. What am I supposed to feed my crabs? They love flowers. I mean, over here, I think I have honeysuckle somewhere. If you don't gather enough to get you through the winter, then you're buying from someone else, which is fine if you know who they are. But you can, 
if you put it away for winter, then you have it for your crabs. You can have fresh flowers, dehydrated. You can have them all winter. With the leaves, which I was trying to figure out where I put them. These are the leaves that fell in the fall. So it's the opposite. If you let fall go by and you don't gather up a garbage bag of leaves before some, before fall comes back, you're not going to have any leaves. So go out, use a garbage bag on a dry day, gather them up, leave it open, and store your leaves in there. If you only need a couple Ziploc bags or use a grocery store brown bag, fill it up with those leaves, uh, staple it shut, tape it shut, you'll have them. Because if you don't, you won't have any. The lichens, lichens, I like to, I like to if it's not too cold, gather moss and lichens in the winter time because there's light, less insects. But if you order from me and you get it and you're like, I have extra, what do I do with it? You can store it open, store it in something loosely closed, allowing light every once in a while. Don't have to water it. Um, lichens do get hard. They're hard sometimes in the woods. Then it rains and then they're fresh and soft again. I get um, my lichens and my moss and a lot of my bark and stuff off of over 150 acres of our private land. I have three acres here with berry briars, bushes, maple trees, oak trees. Everything is sourced locally that you see here. Um, I didn't even spend money on the dehydrator. I found it in my father-in-law's basement or his barn that we're cleaning out. Brand new, never been used, still in bags. Um, so if you look around, you don't have to spend a lot of money. You can, you can do this on a budget. Uh, a lot of people have stuff they really don't want it. Go to yard sales. You, if you get a dehydrator, it's open cleaning with vinegar and water. Uh, brown grocery bags. I get my groceries now to order. When they bring it out to the car, they're in brown sacks. That's a great place to store moss, lichens, and leaves. And just roll it up, write on it, set it on a shelf. You can toss it right in the freezer in those brown bags. You don't have to buy plastic. I just, to send it, to mail it off, I use plastic to try to eliminate some of the hitchhikers that do come in on that. And if you order moss for me, I do freeze it, I do clean it, but check for parasites that have might have hitchhiked on the way before you just put it in your tank. I think I talked about everything. You can use plastic if you want to use plastic. We're trying to get away from using about you guys, but I'm trying to get away from using so much plastic. I think I talked about this. This is lichens on this branch. I think it's a maple branch that fell off this tree beside of me. Now, you could, like I said, set this in something shallow and pour boiling water over it, or you can freeze it. I did a test on Facebook to show people where you can pour boiling water over moss and lichens. And it doesn't kill it. And whether or not that's going to penetrate something like that, I doubt it. So you then again, something that thick, you, you can freeze. Uh, there's moss on this. This is ash. I have an ash tree that fell. I'm almost out of the ash wood, but it's got moss growing on it. Same thing, boiling water. And uh, you could split this thin. This is thin enough that you could really soak this up with the water in, in this little piece. I've had this little piece with me three years, and that moss is still alive. I've never watered it. My house must be it's at least 45% humidity, even in the winter. So apparently that's enough. So I talked about the snake shed, of how to put up the bark. I don't know if you can see behind me, but this year we have a garden. There's a cat sitting on my radishes. His name's Baby. He's sitting on, he's chasing, I, he's chasing the cicadas on the radishes. And there's lettuce, leaf lettuce, that's mostly for us. Um, the roses, the dahlias, the petunias, the violets. Um, I have tomato plants, cabbage plants, pepper plants, and cucumbers. Most of that the crabs can eat. The onions. The mint, no, <laughs> the marigolds, and then patience, yes. And I think squash and zucchini. 
And on this side, I don't think you can see it, I have two giant sunflowers. Hopefully they'll grow. Well, thank you everyone. I hope I made some sense. I really enjoy helping on the uh, Land Hermit Crab Owner Society and Crab Street Journal. You may have seen me also in the Crabby Hermit. I'm Jeannie Singhass. I have a great team on the Crabby Hermit. Um, just come and check us out. My fellow administrators, Crabby Hermit, Hermit <laughs> or Val Walker, and Carol Fox. And we have a great new team. I'm not going to try to remember everybody because I really so would. But in the Land Hermit Crab Owners team, I mean, amazing people. I mean, Stacy um, Griffith and Stacy May with all of her crab safe food ideas. Just amazing. Uh, we couldn't do it without all these great people. I, like I said, I'm not going to try to name everyone. They're all friends of mine. I don't want anybody mad at me. <laughs> uh, so, come check us all out. And we'll be talking to you later. Let me find my remote. You'll be talking to me all night. Uh, check this one out. Come see us. Bye. It didn't shut off. Moa Lundberg got her first hermit crabs in 2009, not knowing that they would become an obsession that would still be following her more than 10 years later. During her decade as a hermit crab keeper, she has made the first ever correct care sheets in Swedish, started the first Swedish hermit crab forum, and been in contact with pet stores both in person and via email to make them change the way they keep hermit crabs. She has discovered how to tell individual hermit crabs apart through seedy patterns, does her best to inspire and help crab owners in Facebook groups and on her Instagram account at LHCS Sweden. She is a local rep for LHCOS, CSJ, and through her love of hermits has acquired many amazing new friends all over the world. Please welcome Moa Lundberg. Hi everyone and thank you for watching my presentation on how to use SETI patterns to identify individual hermit crabs. With all their shell changes and their growth and color changes during molts it can be difficult to tell your crabs apart, especially if your crabs are the same size or if you have a larger group of crabs. On the legs and claws, your hermit crabs have dot patterns of seti that is unique to every individual. This pattern is sort of like their fingerprint and will remain the same, only increase in size with the crabs as they molt and grow. The best part to look at for a pattern is the limb segment just above their large pincer called carpus. It's an area with clear dots and it's usually easy to see that area even when they're active and move around in their tank. In Cunobita clipiatus, also known as purple pinchers, these dots are dark and easy to see on their exoskeleton. In Cunobita brevimanus, the same dots are yellow and easily visible against the purple or pink exoskeleton. The serie dots in Cunobita violations can vary some from molt to molt in how pronounced they are, and can vary in color too. Cunobita perlatus has white dots, very easy to see against the often bright or dark red of their exoskeleton. For example, Cunobita rugosus have ceradots that are difficult to see properly, but instead they have very distinct so-called stitch marks, a ridge of small bumps on the big pincer. These stitch marks will work just as well to identify the individual with.
When you bring home a new hermit crab, it will only take a few moments to take photos of their big pincer before you put them into their new home. That way it will be easier to learn the pattern and you will always have the photos as reference to identify your crabs with. Take several photos from slightly different angles and different movements from the crabs. From the front, from the side, when they stretch the claw or hold it tighter to their body. Different angles can trick the eye and make it difficult to recognize the pattern. When I show others the pattern, I often highlight the dots in a photo editing program with the help of colors. Personally, I find it easier to look at and learn the pattern without colors, but for the purpose of showing others, it makes it simpler. It is, however, very important to color the dots the same way every time, or your eyes will have trouble recognizing the pattern you saw originally. The same thing goes for the amount of dots you color. Use the same dots or you will create a whole new pattern of colors, which can trick you into thinking it's a different crab. These photos are of Neville. The middle is the pattern I usually look at, but if I color the dots differently and add color to a few more dots, like in the photo to the right, the variation will make it look different. Keep it simple. There are a lot of set of dots. You don't have to use all of them. Look for specific shapes in the pattern and go from there. It can be a geometrical shape, like a circle or triangle, or it can be a heart, or a pattern that reminds you of a star constellation, etc. Again, make sure to color the same dots from photo to photo to avoid confusion. An advice is to choose a specific dot or small pattern within the pattern to use as an anchor to make sure you see and mark the pattern the same way every time. Here you have two of my rogosos. For this species, I can use their stitch marks to track their growth and identify them with. The four photos to the left are of Mr. Gray, and the four photos to the right are of Lao. The upper row are from when I got them when they were tiny, and the lower row are now, a couple of years and several molds later. As you can see, their stitch marks haven't changed. And here's back to Neville, to show how he and his pattern looked like when he was tiny, compared to less than two years and many molds later. The oldest crab whose pattern I followed is Haga. He has been with me for over ten years and his pattern has remained the same. It's only larger and more distinct now. I noticed his pattern right from the start, but I didn't think much about it until after a couple of molds, when I realized it still looked the same. After that, I began using their patterns as a way to tell them apart, and here we are now. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Carol Ann Worms grew up in University Park, Maryland, and spent her summers near Annapolis, Maryland, at Epping Forest. She loved swimming, boating, fishing, and crabbing, of all things. She later lived in Silver Spring, Maryland, attended Montgomery College, where she studied medical technology and graduated with honors. She did her internship at the Washington Hospital Center in D.C., then worked in the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory, where she shortly became supervisor and remained so for 38 years. For 20 years, she taught classes in clinical microbiology. Carol Ann found out about hermit crabs from a friend on the way to Bethany Beach in 1976, then adopted Jonathan Livingston Crab at Ocean City, Maryland. 
Shortly after, she adopted Crab Kate at an aquarium store in Virginia. They were buddies for all of their lives, spent little time in their tank, and loved racing around in her apartment. Upon retirement, Carol Ann acquired a computer and began assisting in the running of the Crab Street Journal, a name she suggested. At one point, she and a crab friend in Boston even took it over. What fun it was! Vanessa of Australia and crab lover Don of Alabama were her virtual crab friends. Years later, Mike Vukoder took care of Jonathan when Carol Ann had hip surgery. They remain very good friends. Carol Ann moved to Shell Point Retirement Community in Fort Myers, Florida, 17 years ago. She was elected as court representative of a large building of over 100 people in the Woodlands and continues to hold that position 12 years later. Having lost Crab Kate after 35 years together, she was blessed to have Jonathan Livingston Crab for a full 45 and a half years. He was a delight to her and to all the residents of Shell Point. Crab Kate and Jonathan received lovely burial services on the lawn by the pond behind her building. She knows they are in heaven and still says goodnight to them when she goes to bed. Please welcome Carol Ann Orms. Hi there, this is Carol Ann. I used to go by Carol of Crab Works. You may have known me then. Uh, I never heard of Kermit Crabs, but some friends and I went to the beach and one of them had just read about them. So she told me all about them and I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting thing, getting in and out of seashells and all that. So as soon as we got there, we went to a crab store, a shell store, and my friend got a hermit crab, buster crab. And uh, he was in and out of her suitcase all the time. And uh, I wasn't too sure I wanted one, but, you know, we were there for quite a while, so I got used to having him, uh, looking at him or playing with him. So on the way home, we went a different route. We went through Ocean City, New Jersey. No, Ocean City, Maryland. And we went in that store, and there was Jonathan Livingston Crab just waiting for me to take him home. So I did, and Jonathan was in this little bitty shell. Can you see that? Look how tiny that is. That's what he came in. And I took him home, and then I needed to go around the beltway to get a tank and some gravel and things like that. And there was Crab Kate. And she came in this shell, just a little bit bigger. You see that? Quite a difference, I would say, than from recent years when Jonathan was in this shell. Quite a difference. But this was 45 and a half years later. So I got very attached to them. Uh, Crab Kate was the boss. She'd push him around. She'd climb up on the tree where he was sitting, his driftwood tree, and peel his feet off so he would fall down and she could have the top spot. And uh, they just were all over my apartment. I had a sunken living room then and they didn't know they could go up the steps, so they just had a good time. And uh, then I moved down here to Florida to a retirement community called Shell Point. And I had to get these crabs down here with me, and boy, I tell you, it was not easy because Amtrak said we'll throw them off if we find them. They wouldn't bring them down, none of the airlines, until we finally got Delta. Delta had Kermit crabs on their list, so I was convinced that I had to have them inspected by a, uh, a veterinarian first. That's a riot. I don't think they'd know anything, but uh, the Chief veterinarian in Tallahassee wrote me a letter and said, 
have them checked by a veterinarian, and then you're good to go. You may take them to Florida. So I cut off the top line of his letter that said I had to see a vet, and I took them with me. And, and a friend went with me. It was her mission to get those crabs down here. So we took them there, and uh, I had them in a little tank with a canvas bag. Checked in when I was there, and the guy whispered to me, why didn't you just keep them in your pocket? <laughs> he was the inspector. Uh, I didn't want them x-rayed, or, or I didn't want them to find out I had this crabs and say no. So I paid their $74, and my ticket was 105 and down we came. And uh, got to stay at a hotel for a while and let and some friends of mine pick them, picked us up and they just couldn't wait to see those two crabs running all around on that bed. They just had a wonderful time. So I was there for a few days till I got here in my apartment at a place called Parkwood. And uh, it's taken, as I said, 45 and a half years for Jonathan to get this big. Crab Kate died when she was 35 of unknown causes, and uh, but I kept him for so long, the oldest living hermit crab race in captivity in the world. Isn't that an interesting thing to be known by? So he ran through my apartment back and forth, out on the lanai, climbing on everything. He had a wonderful time. If I were eating in the dining room, he'd come in there and eat something from a little dish. So he was a busy guy. And I took him out on the walkway here. We have a big open uh, atrium, and I would let him walk up and down there and stay with him. He'd go and visit my neighbors. And uh, so those were some, some of my beginning days with Jonathan Livingston Crab and Crab Kate. I'll show you at least one other little crab I had. See this little tiny thing? Crabby Hayes. Somebody talked me into getting him, I think, in North Carolina or someplace. She said, who's going to take him if you don't? So I did, and he lived for about two years and died of unknown reasons. But uh, I just wanted to tell you how I chose the name Jonathan Livingston Crab. In 1970, this book came out, and it was so popular that it was even on the cover of Time magazine, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Everybody read this book, and I was so excited for some reason about this name that that's how Jonathan Livingston Crab got his name. I hope we don't get sued, but so far we haven't. So that's where the name came from. And there was Crab Kate. A girl in my lab told me that that would be a good name for a crab, Crab Kate. She ended up naming her daughter Kate, even. One time I lined up of all the shells from 1976 to 1985 that Jonathan and Kate had been in, and they're right there in the front. And they're three little shells that little Crabby Hayes had before he went on to another world. But it was just fun to keep track. And if I'd done that since then, I would have a zillion shells, so I'd never get a picture of them all. This is a picture of me. I was with my friend, who now lives here at Shell Point. And my two crabs, as you can see there, were probably maybe 15 years old, and uh, we were just down at the beach having a good time. You see this picture? This is Dustin the cat. Dustin was my friend's cat, and I took care of him for a while, but I didn't let him see the hermit crabs. However, he was asleep on my bed one morning, and I put the crab on the bed, and this is the first second he opened his eyes and saw this crab. Then he reached out for him, and I jumped across the room, and I think I lost that picture, <laughs> but he didn't hurt him. Dustin the cat. You might want to know how I knew when Jonathan and Kate needed to molt, because this was all a learning game for me. But I would see them starting to dig 
down in their gravel in their tank and dig and dig and uh, I guess I learned somehow that this was the time and I would put them in another plastic tub in the dark in the den wrapped in a blanket because they have to be in the dark and I put a heater in that room and uh, and a piece of slate right up on top of the of that tank and they would burrow down and find a place to stay. They'd come out many times but then they'd finally settle down and and uh, proceed with the molting process which took many weeks. The older they got the longer it took. Another thing that I would notice when I would look at them uh, when they were digging is that they had what I always called snack packs right inside their bodies and they kept uh, water fluids in there so they would need that to help when they uh, needed to get out of their old exoskeleton so that was a clue that they needed to molt I used to keep an eye on these crabs when they molted I think this is Kate right here and she had just molted and I peeked in the in the molting tank you notice it's all gravel just to see and she had just shed her exoskeleton that was right in front of her so that was always a happy day when they were molting I used to peek underneath I'd take the lid off that I had over top of them and maybe I use a flashlight you can see Kate here has just molted and her exoskeleton is lying right in front of her and uh, there's a towel around here because they kept them in their tank regular tank with a towel in those days things changed over the many years as to how I would do this but that's the way I did it when they were younger and uh, I was always so excited when they molted to see that exoskeleton lying at her, right in front of them Kate would shed that exoskeleton and when her own exoskeleton, the brand new one, would get hard enough then she would start eating the old exoskeleton, that's what this shows, uh, to get back all those nutrients that she lost. And you could hear her in there just crunching away like she was eating potato chips. And uh, I love to peek in there and see that going on. And here she is. She has well, she is working on that exoskeleton to eat it, but notice how brown her legs are. She's turned from a kind of a, a, a skin color like my fingers to a healthy brown, and she'll be ready to go soon. But she's still eating that exoskeleton. Loves it. This is a picture right here that you may be looking at uh, when uh, Jonathan molted, and you can see his really pink exoskeleton. He had shed the, the old one which is sitting here in a pile and look how pink he is. I mean, he's just plain pink skin. But he was molting in the coconut fiber at that time and I tried that once but it took all the shine out of the seashell. So I never used it again. I just used the really fine gravel and believe it or not I had that gravel for another 45 and a half years because I bought it when they were babies. So they were just in the storage tub with a blanket around them and a heater in the room. And But look how pretty pink they are. He was when he first molted. When I put them in their tub to molt, this is one with gravel with slate on the top. And over the years, I had to keep raising that. They sat on the, the slate sat on yogurt jars for a while but they were too short so I had to move to taller glasses to hold the slate roof up and then put something on top to keep it heavy enough so he didn't keep coming out of there but you can see he's just molted underneath there so it was an interesting trial and error system but it, it seemed like it always worked you know Jonathan and Kate were eaters and they were fussy eaters they didn't always eat what other people said their crabs ate but they loved fresh spinach leaves and little bowls of powdered calcium. They didn't eat those other calcium things 
that everybody else said they gave their crabs. They didn't like that. They liked that powder. And uh, they liked eggshells. Always boiled and gave them eggshells. And they sat there and sat there and crunched and crunched those to pieces. So there was nothing left. Even when they were molting, I'd throw eggshells in there. Loved crab apple tree bark and oak leaves and other kinds of leaves and walnuts. <laughs> And, uh, you know, neighbors would give me shrimp when they had shrimp, and I would just give them the tails. They didn't like the meat. I ate the meat. They ate the crunchy tails we shared. And for years, I bought those sun-dried baby shrimp and uh, worm castings which was later in green sand. I think I just told you all that. And we, I had rainbow rocks in the corner with two holes in them, and they loved to sit on those rainbow rocks. Those were their favorite places to sit. And spangum moss. Boy, they loved to sit there and chew on that, eat it up. And uh, they have an open stump that Mike gave to them, and they loved to get in there and chew on that wood. They were fussy little rascals, but they would try almost anything. <laughs> I, again, this was a picture. Uh, I made a poster of their 21st birthday. Well, that was a long time ago, and there they are, the two of them, getting bigger, sitting in front of their poster. A few years ago, a couple of years ago, uh, my neighbors wanted to know all about Jonathan and Kate. And so I pinned a bunch of pictures on this board, a little crooked now, but I went down and gave a speech to tell about all these. So you know about all these from 1978 to 85, and this sweet little thing in this pink murex shell. And here we are up in the top of a, of a tree where Kate used to pick Jonathan's feet off the top so she could have the top spot. King of the mountain, you see this? King of the mountain all the time. It even says that here. King of the mountain. And she chased him all over the living room. And look at this plant. Here he is up here on the top of this plant, hiding from her. I took care of Justin, my girlfriend's cat, one time. And he just spent his time guarding this tank. Didn't hurt them, didn't get them, didn't let the crabs out. And uh, they were tussling over some shells. Give me that shell, he says. And then I made a Christmas card one time, and it took me forever and ever to get the two of them to sit, into this, sit inside of this little sleigh. But I sent it out to everybody. Some people didn't know what I was sending. I had to tell them. And there they are just running around, looking at new shells trying on a shell over here to see what's right. This was a birthday, 30 years together, birthday card. And I have a friend who was uh, excellent in uh, calligraphy. And she was always making him cards. He's had little beady eyes. So just peeking in, she made a little card for them. That was their tank when they had a tree in it. And I used to pull that cover up at night to keep them warm and dark.
it's been an interesting time and I'm at the age now where crawling around on the floor looking for Jonathan underneath the furniture or Kate it's just a little bit hard to do so I'm not I'm not convinced that I should get another crab at this point but boy I have a lot of memories to listen to think about and a lot of crab friends and my name was given out uh, I think by Mary Akers and 45, 50 cards came from all over the country from people for sympathy for my loss of Jonathan. Jonathan was in a very good molt but taking a long time. I kept him in the den in a tub with gravel in it and slate roof on its top and he would bury down there. It was taking him quite a long time and I looked at him with a flashlight every day. You know they're supposed to stay in the dark but I had a peek. And uh, he finally had a perfect molt, shed that whole exoskeleton and there he was sunk back in his shell and he didn't look right and I knew he was gone. So I don't know whether it's just old age or what but uh, he's in heaven now and I miss him terribly. But uh, He's had a wonderful burial out in the backyard by our pond and one of my good neighbors used a big deep hole digger and dug down and I had him in a cellulite or whatever that is, plastic box with the moss that he loved so much and a little heart because he died on Valentine's Day and a little gold cross on a chain. And something written to say who he was. So he's near Cape back there. And I had the exoskeleton which was perfect but you know I thought I'd probably spend the rest of my life staring at that thing so I buried it too in another box near Jonathan. So there they are and I walk back there and I look and I look up in the sky and I know he's in crab, crab heaven because God created him. So that's my story <clears throat> and uh, it's been an interesting one and uh, to all those people who sent me all those cards and I don't know your email addresses but I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. That was wonderful. I didn't know that I was going to get so many cards and wonderful things written and pictures drawn and photographs and one fellow sent me 61 cents. <laughs> it was just wonderful to get all those little gadgets and doodads people sent me. Thank you for that. It made a huge difference in my life. So, I think that's about all I can tell you right now. And uh, I look forward to seeing you a little bit more. And my th many thanks to Tammy, who's done such a job to do this for us. Uh, I've known her for a long time. I've been to her store in Mount Dora, and she came all the way down here to, to uh, Fort Myers. Uh, to do this filming. So thanks. I miss you all. I remember the Crab Street Journal, which I named many years ago. Worked with Vanessa in Australia. and We just had a great time doing those things. So now I'm charge, in charge of my big building here. And I have been for 11 years, and that takes up so much of my time. How silly that I do that, but I love it. <laughs> Thanks for stopping in. Bye-bye.